Commissioner, why don't we turn the meeting over to you at this point, please? All right, so we will call this meeting of the State Investment Council to order. I'm going to begin by having uh, Andy, if you're on. Good morning, Commissioner. So if Andy could please call the roll uh, to establish a quorum. Governor Lujan Grisham. Yes. Commissioner Garcia Richard. I'm here. Treasurer Eichenberg. Here. Secretary Romero. Here. Mr. Jennings. Here. Mr. Lavender. I'm here. Mr. Rawson. Present. Mr. Messina. Here. Mr. Teas. Here. Ms. Allen. Mr. Bingaman. Here. Madam Chair, we have a quorum. All right, excellent. Thank you very much for that, Andy. We're going to move to our first voting item, approval of our agenda for the day. Uh, do I have a motion for approval? This is Harold. So moved. Move. Second. All right. I'll take a motion from Member Lavender, and it sounds like a second from Member Jennings. Yes. Yeah. We will do. We will do a roll call uh, vote on a motion to approve today's agenda. Andy, if you would call the roll. I'm sorry, I was on mute. Governor Lujan Grisham? Commissioner Garcia Richard? Yes. Secretary Romero? Yes. Treasurer Eichenberg? Yes. Mr. Lavender? Yes. Mr. Rawson? Pass. No, I'll say yes. Mr. Jenny? Yes, please. Mr. Messina? Yes. Mr. Teas. Yes. Ms. Allen? Mr. Bingaman? Yes. Madam Chair, the agenda is unanimously approved. All right, so the uh, October 26th minutes were sent out uh, ahead of time, ahead of this meeting. So I'll now entertain a motion to approve those minutes. It's Harold, so move. Second, motion. motion from Member Lavender, second from Member Jennings. Any discussion on that motion? Okay, let's do a roll call vote to approve uh, October 26 minutes. Governor Lujan Grisham. Commissioner Garcia Richard. Yes. Secretary Romero. Yes. Treasurer Eichenberg. Yes. Mr. Lavender. Yes. Mr. Rawson. Yes. Mr. Jennings. Yes. Mr. Messina. Yes. Mr. Teas. Yes. Ms. Allen. Mr. Bingaman. Yes. Madam Chair, the uh, the minutes are unanimously approved. All right. So uh, before I turn it over to Steve, I just want to let you all know I'm going to have to hop off uh, this meeting for a, probably about a half an hour at 11 o'clock. So if I could turn it over to someone else to chair at that time, I will do so, and then I'll be back on after that. So uh, with that, I'm going to go to uh, the SIO briefing from Mr. Moise. Agenda item 2A for those listening at home. And thank you, Commissioner. This is Steve Moise, and it's my pleasure to be with you on the call this morning. Uh, may I ask you to take a look at the State Investment Officer's briefing uh, for those of you who don't have a copy of it, I'll be happy to read the things that I highlight. We always begin by opening comments regarding the following. Total distributions to the state over the last 12 months from the permanent funds have been $1,098,557,000. The net asset value, the assets under management, if you will, as of yesterday, $35,631,861,000. Then we talk about the price of oil because it is so important to the permanent funds and provides us with our inflows. West Texas Intermediate, as of yesterday, was at $76.75, 
The New Mexico intermediate price is always a bit lower, and as of yesterday, it was $73.30. We then take a look at the rig count in New Mexico. As of Friday, November 19th, there were 83 rigs active in our state. As of a year ago, the number was 55. I'm not going to get into detail on natural gas because we're not having an easy time getting current numbers, but suffice it to say that as of August 31 this year, New Mexico's natural gas price was $6.22 per MCF. And then I will comment on the U.S. price as of Friday of last week, which was $5.04 per 1,000 cubic feet. So now you know more than you ever wanted to know about those matters. Um, let's then move to item number three on my report. I just want to highlight two things there. This relates to distributions from the permanent funds in light of some of the things I just said earlier. Fiscal year 22 estimated distributions will be $1.154 billion. That's projected to be $84 million more than fiscal year 21. The important thing that we like to emphasize about how the permanent funds help the state relates to the distributions from those funds. So over the last 11 years, distributions have totaled $9,714,000,000, approximately 15, 15.5% of the state budget. Moving on to council matters, item C on the page. Just to remind everyone that we will have no December meetings, and the January dates are listed for you there. Related to operations, we continue to search for some new staff members, a financial analyst in the accounting department, a public equity analyst to work with Starla, and I do believe we have found someone for that position, and we are about ready to make an offer for that. An analyst for Paul in the real estate and real return asset class, and an analyst for Keith in the fixed income area. So we're looking for four people, and we will be looking for more as we take a look at who we are able to hire in the months ahead. Uh, I want to mention also that Brent and Nick will be commenting on our November 16th exit conference from our auditors regarding our audit. Uh, our office continues to telework. We're coming up on two years. Under external relations, you'll find it interesting that Representative Miguel Garcia will likely be introducing a bill to fund a study regarding consolidation of para and the ERB investment management functions. There may be other bills introduced relating to that same topic. Charlie's going to tell us in just a minute about any client matters that are worthy of mention, but before he does, uh, Commissioner, if you and Brent would give us the good news about the inflows that the state land office is sending over, we would appreciate hearing that. Well, we didn't coordinate ahead of time, so Brent, what's what's your number for this month? The number, I'll, I'll fill in there if I may. The contribution uh, this month from the state land office, $127.6 million. And last year's 
number for October was 63 million. So a bump from 63 to 127. And I think the 127 was a all-time high from what I recall. Commissioner, I think in the past you've told us you're expecting those numbers to continue to either hold or increase. Is that right? Yeah, I mean, that's, those are our projections. Um, and, you know, we, we're, we're dealing with, with a number of just sort of administrative issues that um, – make the distributions a, a little bit lower than what we're actually pulling in because we've, we've got some of that money in suspense. But in general, the trends are um, holding very strong. Thank you. So, Charlie, if you would give us any comments you might have on client matters. Thank you, Steve. Uh, I'll be brief. Uh, we do continue to see interest from potential clients. Uh, the latest last week from a uh, potential government and governmental entity in northern New Mexico that wants to diversify about two to three million dollars of investments. We'll have some initial discussions with them next week. Uh, New Mexico Tech, which is the second largest client uh, for the council, will be rebalancing their portfolio. Uh, that includes several million dollars of private market investments uh, by 2022. Uh, they are our third client out of the 23 that we currently assist uh, to, uh, to invest in real estate, private equity, and other less liquid investment pools. Uh, they do that for greater diversification. Uh, as of the end of October, we're managing $1.75 billion for those governmental clients. Um, that's um, pretty remarkable. I have nothing else, um, Madam Chair and Steve. Charlie, thank you. Uh, Madam Chair, if I may comment on the dashboard. Each of you has a copy of the November dashboard. Uh, we have a little bit different format in the top left corner under SIC fund statistics. We're listing our seven funds now so that you can get a little bit better picture of those. Uh, and rather than read them, I'll leave it at that. And as Charlie just mentioned, in addition to those, we have the client dollars. Madam Chair, that's the end of my report. All right. We'll go to Council for questions. Any questions for Steve? If not, we'll head to uh, Mr. Smith's report, the Chief Investment Officer, Agenda Item 2B. Thanks, Madam Chair. Good morning, everyone. Um, so just, just a couple of items for you today. Uh, probably the, the biggest news out there uh, in the market is that Jerome Powell was reappointed as Fed Chair this week. Uh, I'm sure, sure you saw that on Monday. Uh, that's really an affirmation of how widely and well-regarded he was in his first term. Uh, that first term was uh, began in 2018 and will expire uh, in February uh, 2022. Um, he was first appointed to the Fed in 2012. I think you know a, a lot of folks on our side, on the investment side, you know, appreciate his uh, his more businessman's approach to the job. Uh, that's in contrast with the more academic approach that his predecessors, so at least the last three, have taken. Um, it's his, his communi communications and things that he does are, are, are very easily understood uh, by, by the markets and investors. Um, he does face a very different economic environment in the second term, and we outlined outlined some of those expectations for environmental change in the last inv annual investment plan. So, so it would be kind of interesting to see see how he responds to uh, to much different markets. But but I think a good bit of confidence uh, you know, remains uh, in the Fed with uh, with Jay Powell at the, at the helm. Um, otherwise, we've got a full for you today, um, including the normal quarterly performance reports. There's some very good numbers in those reports that I'm sure as you've seen as you've browsed them before the before the meeting. And uh OVK, Thompson and Mercer will, will get to those uh for you in, in better detail. Um from an operational perspective, inflows continue to be very strong. We just heard the, the latest land office number is just fantastic. Um uh but that's in addition to uh capital and profits returns, uh net of capital calls. 
from our uh, private market managers. So we continue to manage the resulting cash buildup um, with a combination of overweights in the public market asset classes, and you'll see those in your performance reports, uh, and the overlay program that you approved uh, several months ago with, with some very good timing. Um, we need a little bit of policy flexibility, further policy flexibility to help out with this, and there's a memo in your packet uh, that we'll go over after the investment uh, to let you know what I think would be helpful. Um, I guess Steve went over vacancies and new hire activity, so uh, I'll just end right there, answer any questions if there are any, and turn it back to the performance report. Cruise control, it's a real difficult, it's a lot easier to drive. I'm, I'm going to ask that all of the members on the call mute their phones, please. We're, we're getting some background noise. So if we could uh, go to questions for this before we go into the performance report. Any questions for Vince? All right, Vince, we'll go to agenda item 2C. Okay, uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and good morning, everyone. Uh, you have both Matthias Bauer and Marsha Beard on the line today. Uh, we'll be presenting the third quarter executive summary. You should have that in your packet, and as we typically do, I'll provide a couple comments on the capital market environment, and then Marsha's going to provide you the portfolio results. Uh, we'll start off on page 18. That is the page that provides all the relevant capital market details, and hopefully those will put some of the portfolio returns that you'll see into context. As Vince mentioned, I think overall the, the, the numbers are, are, are quite good. Um, we have seen more volatility. Um, but the strategy that you've put in place for, for a number of years now, this is the type of environment that uh, it's it's really shown its stuff. So we're, we're quite pleased with, with that. In the bottom left table, you can see the market performance. We have that there for the various trailing periods and across the major asset classes. You're familiar with that. Equities at the top, capital preservation, so your fixed income and cash in the middle. And then your diversifiers, particularly your inflation um, offsets at, at the bottom of that table. Um, as we talked about in, in prior meetings, uh, equity markets, particularly um, public equity markets, did sell off in, in September, um, despite having a, a fairly good start to, to this third quarter of the year. Um, that level of volatility ultimately resulted in more mixed performance overall as you look at those various asset classes and generally more muted returns for the fir uh, third quarter as a whole, although um, much more in line with historic norms. We've seen, and I think in, in some ways, become fairly accustomed to very strong quarterly returns, and that's not that's not the norm, and uh, we'll likely see, see a, a reversion back to more normal levels. Um, that's really... Um, uh, Part of just the economic recovery slowing into the third quarter, we've been on a pace that's been fairly unsustainable, certainly when you compare it to what we've seen the first half of this year. And the Delta variant, as we've talked about, was a, was a large driver for that for that slowdown. We've seen some resurgence of infections, and that overall led to a more cautionary stance. I think in the U.S., um, less so than other places where perhaps vaccination rates are are lagging on a, at least on a relative basis. So, um, so those are um, still areas that um, are, are working them, themselves through the through the markets. And as we head into the winter, um, likely will will continue to be um, front and center. Emerging markets this this quarter in particular um, struggled a bit. Uh, that was then further compounded by what, what continues to be a fairly resilient dollar. Uh, we've talked about China increasing some of the regulatory oversight that, that was responsible for that um, across a number of industries, and I think that was um, that, that that type of oversight and, and, and crackdown was more comprehensive and, and swift than most market participants, um, I, I think, uh, were expecting. So all of that essentially led to just more volatility, more volatility in line with what we typically see. Um, and, and as, as the Fed uh, backs off the, the gas pedal and continues to do so, I think we'll, we'll start to see um, more of that um, going into next year uh, for sure. 
interest rates. Uh, we've talked about that, and, and the Fed they communicate that they'll likely begin to hike in 2022. Uh, Vince already mentioned uh, that Fed Chairman Powell will serve a second term, and so um, that that um, certainly provides some reassurance that that will continue to to happen, and, and that overall puts some downward pressure on on the fixed income markets. So that in combination with, with some of the bond uh, purchase um, tapering that that will that will happen even even this month um, is is uh, working its way through the fixed income market as well. Uh, Fed of course is also keeping a close eye on on inflation and and making sure that it, it doesn't get too far away. They do have a couple options in terms of trying to um, get, rein that back in, but none of them are. Um, uh, painless. Uh, so I think they're being more patient than perhaps they had been in the past. Uh, the last thing I'll mention before uh, turning it over to, to, to Marsha for the portfolio results is just the, uh, the bottom section of, of that table, the, the diversifiers that I alluded to, and, and there you're seeing some of the best numbers in the stack, and that's primarily um, due to uh, inflation-related trends like the demand supply imbalances and the rise in energy prices that we've discussed. Um, and, and so even though for you know, the better part of the last decade, uh, we haven't really seen any inflation and, and those diversifying assets uh, really took a backseat to, to the fastest growing public equity, private equity, a lot of the the uh, capital appreciation asset classes you're seeing now that this uh, this diversified approach and, and something that also has uh, uh, in, in a lot of ways uh, an income component um, does serve a purpose of providing an offset to inflation and in this case is actually um, among the best performers in the portfolio. So as you'll see, real return real estate um, was, was certainly very additive uh, this quarter. So just in, in in light of the the large agenda, I'll pause here, see if there's any questions or comments, or, and be happy to turn it over to Marsha for. Actually, let's, uh, yeah, let's go with Marsha, and then we'll take questions at the end, if that's okay, Matthias. Oh, okay. You bet. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Matthias, and, and thank you, Commissioner. Let's have, go to your um, your page 21 um, and start talking about allocation and performance. Uh, this is looking at allocations for land grant and severance taxes at September 30th. You'll see some variation away from target. We've talked about this. Vince talked about that. And so has Matias and, and your staff, is, and we are working on solutions. Uh, we call this a high-class problem, uh, that you're getting uh, money in an enviable position, but you will see that you you have yeses for all in all boxes for severance tax. Uh, land grant, your underweight, non-core, but as Vince mentioned, item uh, agenda item 3D, we'll be talking about a, a change to policy ranges uh, because of the situation of having having more cash, as, as uh, Vince touched on a few minutes ago. But some variation away from your target um, can't immediately invest in the private assets. Uh, so you're seeing some underweights there causing overweights in cash and in and, and, um, traditional asset classes. So away from target some, some want. Uh, page 22 looks at the other portfolios, tax stabilization down to early childhood. On early childhood, I'll point out that you did make an allocation change that will be reflected in the next policy update. So those no's and yeses, you're actually closer to your approved targets. It's not stated in investment policy at the, yet. Going to page 24, looking at performance against your investment policy expectation for the land grant. You've met your five-year expectation that you are to exceed your policy index uh, over a, a five-year period, and you've done that. You've done that by 15 basis points. A little bit different story for severance tax, where you actually trailed by 50, 51 basis points. A um, little bit different allocation there, but also um, the impact of a, a different private equity portfolio has contributed uh, to that to that as well. So looking at the performance down below, group and, and two groups, land grant and severance tax, is, as Vince mentioned, the numbers are good. Uh, one year number over 20%, over 21% um, net of fees for land grant, 
and over 18 and a half net of fees for severance tax. Those are those are strong numbers, also strong on cal calendar year to date basis, and reflecting a 10 year number, um, 9% and over and at 9% for severance tax. Um, the market the markets have been kind. Uh, looking at attribution on page 25, this is just for the quarter, but I, it, I think it's important to go over. This is looking at land grant and, and telling the blue line is the return you would have received if you would have been at policy targets and if you would uh, earn the bench benchmark for each asset class. So again, RBK says and your staff believes, and I think you believe as well that asset allocation, asset allocation allocation as the biggest contributor to the return. For the quarter, there was um, some detractors. You can see you actually underperformed. The investment pool performance is actually um, your actual performance. So you can see that trailed the strategic allocation uh, return. A couple things going on here. Tactical asset allocation, you can see, was a negative or a detractor from performance. Again, you were not at your policy targets. You were overweight, you know, you were actually overweight in equities, and as Matias pointed out, equity uh, markets in the quarter um, were not as strong as we'd experienced uh, throughout uh, several quarters before. So that was a headwind for you, um, but your manager skill, so your manager value add against the benchmark was positive. So the biggest uh, detractor here was was not being at your policy targets and being overweight uh, to equities in a market that um, um, there was a drawdown in equity markets. The same can be said if you go to page 27 and look for the quarter for severance tax. Again, the biggest detractor there was the tactical allocation, uh, again, which means that you weren't at your policy benchmarks. So, you know, part of that is that high-class problem of having too much cash and not being able to fund your privates as quickly as you would like. Uh, but this is just for a quarter. But manager value add was actually positive for the quarter. Um, going to page 29 and looking at the schedule and in, investable assets, here we're looking at, at the total uh, New Mexico total uh, assets on the first line and then breaking them down by the individual funds, land grants, the second grouping, and you can see that that strong positive cash flow for the first nine months of the calendar year and also very strong investment gains um, despite the uh, slight drawdown in equities for the quarter. Um, severance taxes, you would expect, uh, had a negative cash outflow. And you can look down the line on the remainder of page 29 and then going to page uh, 30, again, seeing those funds uh, that have net uh, cash outflows versus inflows, but all have positive investment gains um, year to date. I'm going to now take you to page um, 33 of your book, and this is looking at land grant versus peers. Again, it's not an objective for you to outperform your peers, peers but it's informative, and the numbers are, are quite strong. The group that we think, the peer group that we think is most relevant to you is all public plans greater than a billion. That's the second grouping there. And again, this is for the land grant. Um, and there, for the quarter, there were 92 other 92 uh, funds in this grouping, of which you were one. Um, you returned, um, as you know, the land grant was up 1.64, trailing its policy benchmark. That gave you a rank for the quarter, uh, 13th uh, for your um, for the quarter calendar year to date. Your rank is at 19, um, and then if we look at the 1, 5, 7, and 10, you're hanging there just slightly above median, which is a good place to be for the three-year. You're below median, but longer term, you're at that and consistently above me median, which is, we think, a very good place to be. Um, and that is reflected on um, the following page, which Per your policy, we're, we, we, you judge your performance based from the policy based on five-year rolling periods. So each of the dots on page 34 is looking back and looking at the five-year um, return in the peer rank. So 
prior to 2014, looking back that five year, you're either at the top or the bottom, um, very volatile in ranks. You have been consistently above me median in 2020. We dropped below for a few time periods, but now you're back above median. That's consistently what we want to see. Less uh, volatility um, and having consistent above median performance, which is, we think, uh, better reflected on the next page, which is looking at your uh, peer rank for your sharp ratio. So looking at the risk adjusted to return and where do you fall there? Well, with that risk adjusted return against your peers, you're in the top quartile, a, a terrific place to be consistently, um, consistently since the 2016 um, in that top quartile. So that's a, I do think this is a remarkable page and you should be quite proud of this, your risk adjusted returns. Um, severance tax follows on page 38. I'll say the difference here is we know that the severance tax, um, comparing that to the same universe, we know severance tax performance has trailed that as a land grant, so your ranks are not quite as strong there. You can see on page 36. Uh, we don't show the five-year rolling plots, but the story would be saying you have more consistency, but it's not quite as strong as, as uh, the peer ranks for the land grant. Page 37 compares at the top, compares your asset allocation versus the median by asset class of this peer group to which we compare you. I'll point out, um, you know, nothing new here that you're below median in your allocation to U.S. equity, above median compared to peers on your non-U.S., uh, about median for fixed income and alternatives. And here I just want to reflect um, that, you know, the cash, again, that high class problem of having cash on the land grant um, puts you um, with a higher allocation of cash. But again, they don't, most funds, the funds that we're comparing to you don't have the uh, the same, can't call it a problem, do not have the positive cash flows for the most part that you do. Um, page 38, let's go to that and look at risk uh, return. On the left-hand side, we're looking at um, this, the same universe, pub, all public plans greater than a billion dollars. The first, the top is five year, the bottom is 10 year. Uh, how you read this is the, if you're to the left, um, you're below median risk. If you're above the line on the vertical, that means you have above median return. You're at about, uh, you're at median return that you have gotten there with less volatility. If we look at the numbers for the five year, in this grouping, you've had over 100% of the return compared to median, but you've gotten there with 70, about 76% of the risk. So uh, equal return, but uh, taking less volatility or experience less volatility or standard deviation to get there. Uh, same story for the 10-year, slightly better story for the 10-year. You you have 103% of the return, um, but you have had less volatility. You had less volatility to get there. You had 82% of the volatility of the median plan. So that's uh, a good place to be. Um, at median, we'd like to see that line get above, but your median or better on your return, and 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 you've done that with less standard deviation. Uh, finally, asset class performance is a summary on page 40. I'm just going to quickly go through U.S. equity, non-U.S., and your fixed income because you have reports from your alternatives uh, consultants. But let's go to page 42. Uh, just uh, quickly on this page, there was no changes to your U.S. equity portfolio, uh, your target allocation for both land grant and severance tax, 20%. No manager hires, no manager um, terminations and there was no significant manager news, so a pretty quiet, quiet period for you. Page 43 looks at the performance of the asset class, and as you know, this asset class has struggled, and it, it, you're not alone there in, in the market, really post financial crisis. It's, it's just been, you know, uh, a market was, has easily favored just passive investments. We've seen periods of that changing. You've restructured your portfolio. 
Uh, but you can see for the five-year period that there's a no, so uh, the expectation for policy is to be the Russell 3000 uh, over the five-year period. That was not the case for the current five-year period. Uh, you trailed by 78 basis points, but um, as you know, there's been restructuring to that portfolio and we're seeing improvements. Uh, there's less bias in that portfolio, so going forward, um, You'll, you should more closely track the benchmark. Um, page 44 uh, looks at that risk return compared to the Russell 3000. Um, again, you're at median return compared to your peers. You've got there a little less risk. Uh, and your sharp ratio or risk-adjusted return is above median. Um, on page 45, just a quick look. And the restructuring of your portfolio, you can see on the top that market capitalization is very close to that of the benchmark, no real biases there. If we look at the sector allocation, uh, because you do have some asset management in the portfolio, you're not right on the benchmark, uh, but you can see they're pretty close. Non-U.S. equity, page uh, 47, same news, no, no changes, uh, no significant news from managers, and the target is 20%. Page 48 looks at performance for the non-U.S. equity portfolio. You've actually met the policy expectation of outperforming. Uh, the benchmark over the five-year period is outperformed by 71 basis points. You've also gone through a restructure of that portfolio. Um, so going forward, again, just uh, we think you'll closer, less, less um, volatility away from the benchmark. Um, and just for your information, we do have the statistics on page 49 and on um, 50 showing you, again, market cap compared to your benchmark. And in this case, not sectors, but looking at re regional biases in your portfolio. Again, uh, you have passive, but you also have active in there, so you're not going to fall right on the benchmark for regional exposure. Finally, your fixed income asset class. Same news there, no manager hires or fires, and no significant manager news. Uh, page 53 looks at the performance. Both your core fixed income and your non-core fixed income has met their policy expectations for that five-year period. The core fixed income outperforming by 104 basis points, the non-core by 151 basis points. And I think if you look at the table below showing and look at core fixed and non-core fixed income, it's really their nice diversification against each other. Uh, Non-core had a better quarter. Uh, there's periods that that was not the case. Um, if you, but if you look calendar year to date, having non-core fixed income is a positive where your core fixed income for the reasons uh, Matthias discussed, a negative return. Um, but if we go out to three, you can see actually core fixed income slightly beat non-core. So uh, diversification, they aren't the same thing. Um, so having that core and non-core has been beneficial to you. The other asset classes will be reviewed by your um, uh, specialty consultant. So I wasn't planning on going into that. So at this point, uh, Matthias and I'll take any questions. So well done you. Yeah, that sounds good. We've got our PMRs here lined up, so let's stop there and take questions from RVK. Questions to RVK, Amy? Madam Chair, John Bingaman. Okay, Member Bingaman. Uh, yeah, question for Marsha. I was just going to ask, um, uh, on page 37 in Diligent, where we're showing the asset allocation versus the peers. Is there any way to break out the alternatives bucket in future presentations? Could you take a look at that for us and see if you might be able to do that? Uh, yeah, the, the, this universe doesn't do. A, we can. We will. We will. We have other means to do that. This universe it lumps things together. So we will. We will get back to you uh, with a comparison. Um, and we, we'd like to see uh, them be a little more granular as well, but we do have access to get you some more information on that. So, yes, we'll provide that to you. Okay, thanks very much. Further questions before we go into our quarterly reports?
right, I think the way I'd like to do this uh, for the staff and our um, consultants as well, we'll do each asset class, um, hear from you all, and then take questions before we move to the next one. So if uh, so, we'll start with staff, go to the consultant, and then council questions. If that works. So we're on agenda item three. Uh, sorry, two D. We'll start with real estate and turn it over to Mr. Chapman. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning. This is Paul Chapman, Director of Real Estate and Real Return. I have Nino Carpinito uh, from my staff, as well as Seth Marcus, Andrew Bradley from Townsend. And I will remind you that the participants from both staff and Townsend are a little different today than from past lineups since Clay Camper recently left to take the position with Florida State Board of Administration, and Jack Koch, who has been our lead consultant from Townsend uh, for many years, uh, left last month for a role with uh, Park Madison, a New York-based advisory firm. So uh, staff in Townsend will be covering three items today. We'll start with the portfolio measurement reports for real estate and real return, and then later on the agenda we'll discuss a commitment to Berkshire Bridge Loan Investors 2A. The PMR begins on page 91 of Diligent. Andrew Bradley will be presenting for Townsend, but I do want to highlight that the real estate portfolio continues to outperform our Odyssey benchmark in all time periods, and a lot of this outperformance can be attributed to our sector selection, which has been to overweight industrial and overweight alternatives and to underweight office and retail. And if you look at page uh, 19 of the Towns of PMR, which is 109 of Diligent, there's a bar chart there that um, shows it graphically, um, a substantial underweight to office, substantial overweight to industrial, um, a relatively small underweight to retail. And this has really been the driving force behind, uh, behind uh, outperformance. Uh, also, as you may recall from our recent structure study that was presented earlier this year, the staff intends to increase our exposure to non-U.S. investments, mostly in Europe. We're going to in increase that range to 10 to 20 percent. It currently sits at 10.7 percent on an NAV basis, and slightly to Asia. It's, uh, it's 6.7 percent now. Uh, expect that to move up to 5 to 15 percent over the term of the uh, structure study. Um, and I want to point out that our current real estate NAV is 9.7% of the fund versus a target of 12%. This is a shortfall of almost $600 million, and we're looking at ways to narrow this gap within the constraints of the pacing model. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Andrew Bradley, who will cover the, uh, the uh, real estate PMR uh, from Townsend. Good morning, everyone. And and thank you for the warm introduction, Paul. As Paul very happily alluded to in his intro comments, we continue to see a strong recovery in the real estate portfolio from the economic downturn that occurred in early 2020. The, the portfolio produced a, a positive 5.2% net return for the quarter, outperforming our NFI Odyssey benchmark by 150 basis points. Uh, this is farther amplifying the, the real estate portfolio's outperformance of the NFI Odyssey benchmark over all time periods. As, as Paul alluded to, this is, we can be contributed to both strategy and, and sector selection. Um, both play a huge role in, in this outperformance, and it's highlighted throughout the presentation. Uh, before, before highlighting performance in, in a bit more depth, I would like to quickly touch on current status of, of the portfolio. I know Paul shed a little bit of light on, on the current status, but just kind of show what, what's, what's occurred over the past year and where we stand now as, as we continue to stay active in the market. The, the current allocation uh, to real estate is 9.7% of total plan assets as of second quarter 2021 versus 12% target allocation. Uh, it's resulting in a 10 basis point drop in allocation from last quarter. This due to the broader capital markets and, and more specifically the equities market continuing to, to feed into the total plan value. Um, but, but with that being said, the, the real estate portfolio did see an increase in value over, quarter over quarter uh, to the tune of $132 million. Uh, that number is net of distributions. 
um, as is highlighted on, on slide six of Silence and Materials, um, through six non-core commitments to, to the venture year 2021, we have committed a total of $466 million. It's resulting in an overcommitment when compared to our pacing and as, as we continue to, to pursue opportunities presented by, by the current market with, with highly regarded institutional managers and, and favored property sectors, um, as we continue to try to slim that margin of current allocation to target allocation. Um, it's important to note Townsend and, and NMS, NMSSC continue to collaborate and, and take advantage of fee savings um, that we're able to achieve on an annual basis. Uh, this number stood at 2.3 million annually from nine managers for or 14 individual funds. The, these fee savings are, are a direct result of NMSSC's partnership with Townsend and, and are 100% to NMSSC. Townsend in no way benefits. Um, we, we achieve these by, by negotiating fee savings for, for our clients, um, by aggregating client commitments and, and negotiating fee savings for all of our clients based on the weight of capital. Now, be, before wrapping up real estate, I, I do have a few, few comments I would like to make on performance as it is everyone's favorite topic, especially in, in times like this. Um, if you all kindly take a look at slide 14 of Townsend Tech, you will find our one-year attribution chart. Uh, this, this chart conveys what piece of the total portfolio contributed to the overall return for the one-year time period. Uh, in this case, each individual piece of the portfolio contributed positively to the 12.8% net return achieved by the total portfolio. Core, value-add, and, and opportunistic all contributed it significantly in their own right. Uh, core can seen to have the largest impact due to sheer size and, and strong positive performance. Both value-added and opportunistic sectors contributed in their own right to, to the tune of 2.4% and 4% respectively. Um, this as, as both sectors saw broad-based write-ups in value. Um, lastly, moving, moving on to the next slide, we show PME analysis or, or public market equivalent, essentially showing how NMSIC's capital would fare in the public market if deployed in the same way it has been deployed in the private market. Uh, calculations for this are, are based on timing and, and value of contributions and distributions made within the real estate portfolio. And as you can see, the, the rebalanced portfolio since 2011 inception has outperformed the identified public index by approximately 270 basis points over the same time period. Uh, I'll wrap my comments up there and open it up for any questions. Great. We thank you uh, for joining us today. And so if I could take questions from Council at this time. Does anyone have any questions on our real estate uh, quarterly review? Hearing none, we'll move to real return. Um, and turn it back over to Mr. Chapman. Thank you again, Madam Chair. Paul Chapman again. Um, the real return PMR begins on page 129 of Diligent. And if you go to page four of the Townsend PMR, or 131 of Diligent, you'll see that we're almost right on target in terms of our financial assets allocation within the real return portfolio. And later on this morning, we're gonna be talking about a commitment proposed commitment to uh, Berkshire Bridge Loan Investors 2A, um, and that will bring our exposure to financial assets up again, uh, up a little bit, um, but the percentage exposure should remain about the same since we're, we'll be bringing later on the year a few infrastructure investments forward um, that will bring the other side of the equation up. Um, and also do note that we have flexibility to sell down the MLP portfolio, which sits in the financial assets bucket and that makes up uh, the majority, in fact, of the financial assets allocation. Uh, Real return had a very strong year uh, with a 16.1% return, so we're happy about that. And that's attributable to a uh, large snapback in the MLP portfolio largely, a strong recovery in the valuation of our energy funds, as well as continuing good performance from our infrastructure portfolio. Much of the immediate impact of the COVID pandemic on the MLP and energy holdings um, 
that kind of hit us in Q1 of 2020, and that is now outside of the one-year returns, but they still adversely affect our three- and five-year numbers. Um, so with that introduction, I'll turn it back over to Andrew from uh, Townsend. Thanks again, Paul. And, and I think those comments cover, covered a lot of what I'm going to cover as well, so not to reiterate too much, but I, I will try to keep this brief. I know we have quite the remaining agenda. Um, I would like to remind everyone that the real return allocation has been lowered from 12% to 10% in May of this year. Um, it's important to note. And, and currently we stand at 8.8% of total plan assets with a sub-allocation breakdown closely mirroring our target of 80-20, as, as Paul just alluded to in his intro comments. Um, another reminder before diving in, the real assets portfolio excludes both the financial assets and MLPs, causing differences in performance between the real return portfolio and real assets portfolio. You'll see this throughout the, the presentation. As, as Paul stated in his opening comments, both, both portfolios have performed exceptionally well over the quarter and, and the one-year time period. Real returns producing a 16.1% net return for the one-year time period, um, contributable to not only the infrastructure and energy investments, but the snapback in the MLP portfolio. Uh, important to note regarding the MLP portfolio, I know Paul alluded to us being able to sell it down at any point, but I would like to also highlight that um, given public market exposure to the energy sector, it has been volatile, and it, quarterly returns have varied significantly over the past six quarters from, from lows of negative 49% to highs of 33%. With that said, returns for the one-year time period currently stand at a positive 55% and are now essentially flat for the longer term. Um, with all that highlighted, I would like to move on to the real asset portfolio. This portfolio currently stands at 7% of the aggregate land grant permanent fund and severance tax permanent fund based on market value. And, and when we include unfunded commitments, we are sitting at 9.1%. Uh, just to highlight quickly activity over the 2021 vintage year, uh, we have committed to two separate infrastructure funds totaling $200 million in commitments. And as Paul noted in his comments, financial assets are not included in the real asset spacing. So the commitments to the Berkshire debt funds executed earlier this year, as well as a proposed commitment later on the agenda, are all excluded from that $200 million value. Now to quickly touch on performance before wrapping up comments. Um, as highlighted earlier, the, the real assets portfolio produced an 11.3% net return for the one-year time period outperforming the CPI plus 300 basis points benchmark by approximately 280 basis points. Additionally, outperforming over the five-year time period by, by 10 basis points. Uh, if you quickly turn your eyes to slide 10 of Townsend material, you will see a similar chart to what we noted in the real estate portfolio review. But in this case, it's, it's broken down into five different sub-portfolios for the real assets total portfolio. Um, Infrastructure, as usual, was a top contributor for the one-year time period. This, again, due, due to the size of the portfolio and a consistent, strong return. As we move forward, uh, infrastructure will continue to be one of our sole focuses for the portfolio. As, as fundamentals for, for the sector remains extremely strong. Um, energy was a positive contributor for the period, to the tune of a positive 3.7% contribution. Um, this, as we saw a strong recovery and valuation for energy funds. Um, and then all other sub-portfolios positively contributed for the year, but had min minimal impact due, due to size of the portfolios. Um, I will wrap my comments up there and, and open it for any questions on the real return portfolio. Thank you so much. And uh, Paul said your name is Mr. Hartley, Andrew Hartley? Uh, Andrew Bradley. Yeah. No, thanks to me. Bradley, too. I'm sorry. Okay. Nice to meet you as well. So, questions from council uh, for Mr. Chapman or Mr. Bradley? Um, Madam Chair, this is Tim. Mr. Treasurer. Could I? Um, thank you. On your slide nine, um, I was just wondering there on your first bullet point if if the uh, if we're talking about modifying the benchmark or if we're ta talking about modifying the um, the allocation. 
Could you go ahead and get close to those a little bit for me? Yeah, this is Paul speaking. So, yeah, hi, Paul. We have a, we, hi, how are you? Long time no see. Um, we have a, um, a structure study that is in draft right now. Um, and honestly, we got a little sidetracked over this discussion around um, creating a new benchmark. And uh, both uh, um, RVK and, and, uh, and Townsend have consulted with us on establishing a um, better ben benchmark than the one we have, which is, you know, generally CPI plus 300. And we went round and round and uh, just decided that um, really the CPI is probably the best benchmark that we're going to find right now. Uh, there are a lot of improvements going on in, in the private markets in terms of benchmarking, but we're not quite there yet. So we'll stick with um, CPI, but we're, I think we're going to go to CPI plus 400 uh, instead of CPI plus 300. Um, because, uh, and, and we may put a cap on that of some sort. Other other funds have done, you know, CPI plus something, but with a cap of 10%, because if inflation runs away, we just we just don't want to be held to an unreasonable benchmark based on inflation alone. Um, then you asked about our sector allocation, I believe. Um, I, I, what, what's going to happen there, um, again, this is subject to the, the – State Investment Council's approval once we present the structure study. So what's going to happen there is you'll see um, timber and agriculture decline as, as a percentage exposure, and the rationale for that is probably clear to anyone who's paid attention to the PMRs. They just simply have not been performing for us for the last several years, so they're earning a smaller uh, spot in the portfolio. Infrastructure will grow, and then we're going to take a lot of things that we current call currently called energy, and we're going to separate them um, and really refer to energy as upstream only, because so much of what we do in energy is renewable energy, and it, it creates some confusion about what our exposure really is. So uh, you'll see, so we're, we're now going to put all those renewable assets into um, infrastructure, and uh, and then we'll just leave energy as being solely um, upstream uh, focused energy uh, investments. Is that responsive to your question? Oh, it just generated more, but thanks, Paul. I appreciate you taking the time. Yeah. Thank you, Madam Chair. Hey, Paul, I, I had a question. Will that structure study be presented first in the um, in the investment committee? Yes. And, and when is that? Is it for the January meeting that you're anticipating that? You know, I was hoping for January, and uh, we've already got three matters, uh, investment matters, that we'll be bringing forward in January. Um, so I'm not sure I want to do it in January. It just I, I've got a lot of – I'm short-staffed, and I have a lot of diligence to get through on the three funds that we expect to bring forward in January, so I may try to push that off to uh, – February or even March. All right, I will look forward to seeing that. Thank you. Further questions for uh, Mr. Chapman or Mr. Bradley? All right, hearing no further, we're going to agenda item 2F, which is the uh, quarterly report on our national private equity program. We'll turn it over to Mr. B and Mercy. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, this is David Lee, Private Equity Director. I'm joined uh, for this performance report by Chris Cassidy, a Portfolio Manager, and also by Richard Pugmire and Amy Ridge of Mercer. Uh, Richard will go through the highlights of this uh, second quarter performance. Performance, as everyone realizes, is lagged. Um, so this would be for the second quarter of the year for the national program. Uh, in a nutshell, uh, the returns have been very strong, uh, double-digit returns, almost 13% for the quarter, and roughly 50% uh, net IRR for the trailing four quarters. Uh, the, this performance includes, uh, obviously, very strong gains, but also elevated distributions, which we always like to see in our illiquid asset class. Um, and with that, uh, let me turn it over to Richard for more details. 
Thanks, David. I'm on page 171 of the of the diligent packet. We're going to cover Q2 performance today, and, and as David and, and Vince have said in their opening remarks, the overall theme is continued strong performance from the national program, which is really what we've seen since Q2 of 2020. The, the first slide is an overview of performance and activity. The quarterly return was 13%, which has been the highest that we've seen in this period of growth after the uh, the negative return we saw in Q1 of 2020. Um, because of the size of the portfolio, this equates to a quarterly gain of $435 million, which brings the total gain since inception from the national program to almost $3.6 billion. The table at the bottom splits the portfolio by vintage year. And as a reminder, these dates correspond to when the SIC launched a new private equity strategy for the national program in 2011. The 2009 and before funds are mostly realized at this stage, so the longer-term numbers like the since inception number do not tend to move too much. Um, the 2011 and after funds have, have really had strong performance across all of the time horizons with a since inception net IRR of 19%. Um, this is also the first quarter where we're showing a 10 year return for the 2011 and after vintage year funds. But you can see that the 2009 and before funds still have an influence as the overall return is 13.6% compared to 19% for the newer funds and 8% for the for the older funds. The one number that's probably popping off the page is the 50% one-year net IRR. And there's really two drivers of that, that number being high on, a, on an overall basis. First, we've really seen strong performance over the last four quarters. It hasn't been just one quarter of, of strong performance. It's been multiple quarters. And, and to be honest, any one of those quarters would have been great to have in a typical year, but we've had four in the in the one year calculation. And second, there's there's really no negative or, or low number included in this calculation. Previously, when we were reporting the one year, we did have that that Q1 2020 number, um, but that is included in the three year number, and and still still strong strong returns at a 20% net IRR. From an activity front, 2021 has has been an active year. We have 350 million of approved commitments to six funds, and we're presenting the seventh fund today. Turning to the next slide, uh, this slide has a summary of the numbers in the portfolio, and I'll just highlight a few. The net asset value increased by 313 million, which was driven by the fifth sizable quarterly valuation gain that we've had in this portfolio. Um, it was also the largest gain. Year over year, this table shows the impact on both the net multiple and net IRR, and it's been it's been positive from these gains that we've seen. You have the since inception net IRR increasing from an 11% to almost 13%, and then the net multiple is increasing from 1.4 times contributed capital to 1.6 times. When you look at the sub-strategy performance, buyout and growth continue to be the strong performers with both strategies above a 14% net IRR in the active funds and then both being near a 1.7 times net multiple. The next page goes into more details on the quarter over quarter performance. And um, this graph shows the strong performance that we've had over the, the last two quarters. Uh, all strategies in Q2 contributed to the gain, but remember that the national program has a small venture capital program at this point. And, and so it doesn't contribute as much. The gains also were widespread with, with 75 funds reporting net gains. Another trend that we're seeing in the portfolio that David mentioned is a lot of realizations and distributions, which is part of what's driving the performance as companies are sold at higher valuations than what they were previously valued at. You can see that distributions um, were at 213 million, which is which is above where they were at in Q1. And in Q3, which we'll report on in the next performance report, distributions ended up being even stronger um, than both of those quarters with 278 million of, of distributions. And just to give you a sense of what's happened this year, through October 31st, the national program has received 742 million of distributions compared to making 397 million of contributions. So right now, distributions have exceeded contributions by about $345 million. And we've received about half of the performance reports at this stage, and, 
It looks like Q3 is, is trending to have another gain. We're at about $180 million gain right now, but that number will change as more performance reports are received. The next slide shows the top cash flow activity and gains and losses by, by fund. Um, I'll talk about the gains. Um, technology has been a strong part of the story in 2020 and continuing in 2021. And it's, it's a part of the, the story on what's driving distributions as well. But I think what we've been seeing since Q4 is other industries participate in this market strength that we're seeing. Uh, last quarter, we, healthcare was a big driver of the, uh, of the reported net gains. And this quarter, we have some of the top gains were from retail and consumer discretionary companies. And another driver of the overall quarterly gain is just the lack of sizable losses in the portfolio. And you can see that the, the top reported losses aren't, aren't really that large. The next slide shows the high vintage year performance compared against the Burgess Private Markets bench, benchmark. And since 2011, performance has been above median in all years except 2013. Uh, absolute performance has been strong across multiple vintage years in 2011 and after, with every year but 2013 generating a 14% or greater return. 2016 is the strongest year with a 26% net IRR. And it's really driven by multiple managers in that in that vintage year who have generated more than 22% in their in their funds. 2013 is a good year from an absolute basis with a 13% return, but relative to performance of individual funds in that benchmark, that portfolio is below median. And it was really dragged down by a couple of funds. One did a considerable amount in energy. Um, which was a drag on performance. We, we have seen some recovery there, and that fund is a positive performer at about 8%, but it's still tracking in the fourth quartile compared to other funds. And then there's secondary funds and a buyout fund focused on Asia, which, which are also underperforming against the benchmark, although they've still generated good performance on an absolute basis. The uh, next fund, the next slide shows uh, the public market equivalent return over the last 10 years. The MSCI ACWI benchmark covers multiple countries and geographies, including the U.S., Europe, and Asia, which is similar to our focus in the national program. And the national programs outperformed that benchmark by 6%. Public equity markets in the U.S. have, have continued to be strong and, and had, a, had a strong run over the last 10 years. And the national program is under the Russell 3000 by 1.2%, but above the Russell 2000 by 1%. And the Russell 2000 is the, the 2000 smallest companies in the Russell 3000. And, and then, a reminder, uh, sorry to interrupt, Richard. Maybe as a ahead. reminder for those that are not familiar with the public market equivalent, uh, this is an attempt to try to compare apples to apples. Uh, these private market asset classes, because of the way they draw capital slowly and occasionally, uh, we measure uh, we measure it by IRR, which is the most accurate way to measure it, but at the same time, it's not as comparable to a time-rated return uh, in, a, in the public sector when you just you, you put the money in and then the whole thing is growing at one time versus pieces of it. So this par public market equivalent is an attempt to when measure the cash flows, when the cash flows come in, and so you're just getting those time periods in these markets uh, when the, the cash is actually invested. So it's more of an apples-to-apples -apples comparison than just looking at, for instance, just a 10-year uh, ACWI return or a 10-year Russell 3000 return. So hopefully that makes sense. Thanks, David. Moving to the next slide, and we'll, we'll end on this slide here, which is more detail on the different strategy components. We have a 300 million to 400 million annual pace. We, we hit that range in 2020 with 330 million close, and we'll likely end 2021 at 410 million, assuming the proposed approval this month. The um, sub-strategy and geography, our targets are all within the, the, the target ranges that we put forth in the structure study. Um, we still have one general partner above 10%, they're at 10.6%, so almost below that 10% that threshold. Um, but overall performance of that, of that manager has been at a 16.5%. And 
and a 1.6 times net multiple. So it's been, been very additive to the portfolio. And then on a fund series basis, there are four fund series that are above 5%, but you know, a lot of that is, is driven by performance um, because the lowest performance of the four is at a, at a 21% net IRR. We have been disciplined with new managers over the last 10 years. Um, 30 managers have received new commitments since um, 2011. Um, there's still a lot of older funds in the portfolio, but you know, one of the good things about, about good market conditions that we're seeing is, is we are seeing more funds get, get fully realized. And, um, you know, if you take out a lot of those vintage, the, the, the older funds, the 2007 or older funds, we'd be at about 70 funds. But it just takes a long time for these older funds to be fully realized. And with that, I'll conclude my remarks. I'm happy to answer any questions about the, the national program. Thank you, David and Richard. Um, and, you know, in the midst of all of those pretty astonishing and it sounds like historic numbers, I, I heard you say one thing that I wanted just clarification on, on what I heard. You said something like the uh, NAV had an increase of $300 million. Yes, that's right. And is that for the quarter? So, so the, the net asset value, there, there's, there's basically three components that, that go into the net asset value change. One is contributions to the, to the underlying funds, which typically increases the uh, net asset value because that's basically fund managers investing that capital into companies. And then you assume that they're going to, what they invest is going to be valued at, at cost, at least, at least at the time of investment. Um, you, you also have portfolio gains or losses, which can move the net asset value up or down. Um, but then you also have distributions, which distributions will actually um, cause the net asset value to decline because the fund manager is selling a company that's in their fund and then distributing the cash to, to limited partners, and so that's no longer in the fund. And that's so part that of what we're... Like, sort of like a net? Do we consider it a net? Because all it's, of the it's other... Called, it's, it's called... Yeah, it's, it's called net asset value just because it's net of fees and carried interest as opposed to kind of a gross valuation. But I guess my question was, was the $300 million increase over what, what period of time, I guess? That was oh, that was just the quarter. That was just quarter two. Holy moly. Is that, uh, you said it was probably the highest, or is that like a, is that usual? That seems no, it, I mean, it's, it, so if you, if you turn to page 173, this, this kind of breaks out how March 31st NAV went from kind of a, a 3.3 billion to 3.6 billion, basically. Um, you know, a lot of it was driven by the portfolio gain of 435 million, which, yeah, I, I, we haven't seen a, a gain of that size, um, over a quarter period. Um, it actually was partially offset by distributions exceeding contributions, which, which would have caused NAV to go down. That's why you don't see a 435 million increase in NAV. And it's, and it's only, uh, it's only the, uh, 313 million increase. Only 313 million. Okay. Thank you. Uh, do we have further questions for this group? Madam Chair, I have one. Um, uh, I, I can't tell who that is. Okay, Mr. Treasurer. Um, thank you. Hey, on slide nine, on your uh, 1.2 difference between the Russell and the SIC, is that due to management fees? Not, not necessarily. I mean, when when you're looking at the Russell 3000, a lot of the performance has been driven by large cap technology stocks. Um, we, we do, we do invest, we, we do use net cash flows in calculating this. So, you know, if, if a fund calls for management fees, that management fee is invested in the Russell 3000 in the, in the calculation. And so there is a return generated on that management fee. Whereas, you know, at the fund level, there is really no, no return generated from that management fee. So the other investments that the fund makes have to make up for that, that management fee. But I think I think the bigger driver is just kind of the overall performance of you know particularly large cap tech. Would you yes, consider uh, our management fees high? The management fees in the portfolio. 
well, do you consider our management fees high? In no, the management fees are, are similar to what other investors in private equity would pay. Okay. Okay, thank you. Mr. Thank Treasurer, you, Mr. 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 Treasurer, this is uh, David Lee. So yes, David. Uh, private equity fees typically are higher than public uh, public market fees, but uh, the performance uh, typically uh, is supposed to make up for that. Uh, what you're talking about in this chart, that differential, I would not attribute to fees. I would attribute to a remarkable 10-year period in U.S. markets. And that's why the uh, MSCI ACWI is lower because it reflects more of a, a global basis. And uh, those very high returns for both the Russell 3 and the Russell 2 uh, reflect the fact that uh, for a lot of these 10 years, uh, the public markets did, uh, as Richard said, with sort of a heavier concentration to larger technology companies, uh, did outperform uh, the, the portfolio. But um, we've seen that trend reverse uh, in the last year. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, John Number Bingaman. Question. Yeah, Member Bingaman. Just, just on that same slide, um, and I, is there any reason why we can't break out this 13.6% and break it out into the two buckets that you have on on your slide four of 2009 and before and 2011 and after and just show all three numbers? Because, I, you know, I, I think part of what's going on is that the 13.6% is being weighed down substantially by the pre-2009 uh, investments that were, you know, under different management. And so is there any reason we can't just show all those numbers on slide nine? Yeah, we can we can definitely do the do the calculation um and do do all three numbers. That wouldn't be a, that wouldn't be a problem. We we just have to kind of talk to Indian and and have them set up the reports. But I think that is I think that's definitely doable. Okay, and I yeah, agree. I mean, it looks like you already have the numbers on slide 4 if I'm understanding correctly. Yes. Yeah, and, and historically the reason why you know when 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 the uh, portfolios was being uh, kind of built for the 2011 and after, you tend not to kind of have a lot of performance early on. You know the the J curve effect that we we've, we've talked about, and so so the public market equivalent tends to be less relevant for for younger portfolios because you have that that movement in the public markets, but the but your private portfolio is not necessarily generating any gains yet because the the you know the fund managers are still working with those portfolio companies to generate value, but now the 2011 and after I think is mature enough that that, that measure would be meaningful. Good. Thank you. Thank you, Member Bingaman. Anything further? All right, we'll move to our last PMR for this agenda. It's Agenda Item 2G our New Mexico program, and we'll turn it back over to Mr. Lee and Mercer. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, this is the New Mexico program, which, uh, as a reminder, is mostly venture capital funds. Uh, now, uh, venture capital has actually been the strongest asset class over the last 12 to 18 months, uh, even stronger than some of the buyout and growth strategies that we have. Uh, our, our program is a little bit different, obviously. We've got some side letter requirements. And what Richard will go through in the performance report is that we've seen some, some very disparate performance. Uh, some of the more recent fund commitments are reflecting uh, the strong markets here in venture capital, and some of the older funds uh, reflect um, sort of more stable valuations and also uh, public ownership. It's public ownership, uh, ownership of public shares that IPO that are prevalent in both recent funds and older funds. But uh, in the recent funds, it's really helping where there's an IPO pop. And with the older funds, it's more of a, a stable or a stable to declining kind of effect. Um, and with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to Richard again. 
Thank you, David. Um, similar to the national program, we'll, we'll start with a slide at the beginning to show the time horizon performance by the category of funds in the regional program to give you a better sense of what's driving performance over different time horizons. And I'm on page 199 in the uh, diligent packet or page four of the, uh, of the uh, New Mexico program report. We, we do split fund investments here by 2008 and before and 2016 and after just to reflect the change in, in, the, uh, in the statutory requirement in the program for managers to open an office in New Mexico. Um, that requirement was removed and it really opened up the possibility of adding more high quality managers to the program, which has been the focus beginning in 2016. And it drove the reason for splitting the portfolio here. Um, and so far it appears that, that this, this change has added value to the program from a return perspective so far. Um, the recent fund commitments continue to generate strong performance that we've seen in prior quarters, even though they're still relatively young. Uh, since inception, these funds are at a 30% net IRR and a $54 million gain. The one-year IRR um, for the 2016 and after funds may, may look high to you at 80%. It's actually similar to what we're seeing happen in venture capital funds widely. But um, just kind of a note of caution on that return, too. These are largely unrealized gains at this stage, and we haven't really seen the sizable realizations in the New Mexico program because a lot of these investments are newer. So there will be volatility in these in these numbers going forward. The newer funds do not have as much influence on the on the uh, overall return because the relative size is smaller and they have less history. Um, from a return perspective, the co-investment funds have a large influence on both near-term and since inception performance due to their longer history and the larger size, and they could continue to have an influence since they are largely unrealized. And you can see over the last year, the co-investment funds are are slightly down, and they have a since inception IRR of 1.2%. We have seen some volatility in quarterly returns for the co-investment funds, driven by one of the largest holdings being publicly traded, and then that mark-to-market that happens to the stock price on a, on a quarterly basis has, has really been one of the drivers of the performance. From a commitment activity perspective, we have done four commitments this year for $35 million in we currently have a, a good pipeline of fund opportunities that we're evaluating for 2022 in the New Mexico program. Turning to the, to the next page, um, we're continuing to see the trend of net asset value increases um, in, in the New Mexico program as well. Uh, this quarter was driven by both capital calls and portfolio gains. Uh, the since inception net IRR has increased from, from 0.9% to 1.7% year over year and really kind of driven by the new fund commitments that we've previously spoke about. You can see on this page the year-over-year -year change in, in um, fund investments is one is, is a since inception return of 1.4% to 4% for the active funds. And note that on the bottom the 10-year return is better than the since inception return at a 5.5%, which I think shows the improvements in the program over the last decade. And the next page shows the uh, the quarter over quarter performance. You can see um, what's really driving that net asset value increase, which is thirty million dollars of contributions, and then also twelve million dollars of gain. Uh, the contribution was really driven by the recovery fund continuing to draw capital, as well as the new fund commitments being being more active in drawing capital. The gains are driven by write ups in a couple of funds that we'll we'll show on the next slide. Post Q2, we haven't seen the same level of contributions because the re recovery fund is almost fully called at this point. So Q3 had about seven million of contributions and about six million of distributions. And, and also with about half of the funds reporting, we're tracking at about a $1 million loss for uh, Q3, which I'll, I'll talk more about on the next slide. So I'm on page 202 now of the, uh, of the, of the presentation. Three of the top five largest capital calls were from the recovery fund. Um, and we've had some small distributions from, from some of the other funds, but really no sizable distributions. On the gain side, there was a particularly large gain from one of the funds, uh, about $12 million, that was driven by a company going public. And having companies go public tends to create more volatility in the, uh, in the performance as they're marked to market every quarter. And this particular company actually saw a decline in its, its stock price at the end of Q3 
which is what was driving the, uh, the the quarterly loss right now that we're seeing in Q3. But it was also offset by some gains in some other other uh, funds that that have come through. But as a reminder, these companies, um, these public companies, are still held by the fund manager, who who maintains discretion on whether to sell or hold. And you know, with with companies that that go public, there is typically a six month lockup after an IPO, so the manager cannot sell during that period um, as part of as, as part of the company going public. Um, also, on the on the public company note, um, when you look at the top reported net losses. Um, Four of the the five were co-investment funds, and that's really the volatility of a publicly traded company um, that's held across multiple tranches in the uh, in the co-investment fund. That saw a decline of a, of about nine percent. Uh, the next page shows benchmarking for the New Mexico program, but um, as a reminder, this is a differential return program, so we're not necessarily looking to outperform benchmarks, but we uh, we do want to see a positive return. And in 11 of the 17 vintage years shown here, there are positive returns. And 2016 through 2018 have been particularly strong from an absolute basis with, uh, with, with returns at 22%, 15%, and 38%. But they are tracking, particularly 2016 and 17, are tracking below median just due to the strength of the venture capital market right now. Um, the next slide shows the public market equivalent calculation similar to what we do with the national program. And you'll see that the state program is actually underperforming compared against the MSCI ACWI, Russell 3000, and Russell 2000. And then this next slide is the, the second part of what's important to look at with the New Mexico program, which is the economic impact. And the, the overall theme of the economic impact is the recovery fund has, has definitely had a positive impact on these numbers. The recovery fund has increased the number of New Mexico companies and has helped drive the increase to 108 with 32 uh, new companies receiving investments in the last 12 months. Um, we're still seeing new company investments from the funds, but there, there was five new company investments from the fund um, as, as compared to the uh, the recovery fund, which the majority of the new companies is coming from that. The uh, total invested from the from the SIC and the severance tax fund is up to $370 million now. And at the fund level, it's at $477 million, with more than $96 million invested over the, over the last year. And again, the recovery fund is a large driver of, of that number. We have three companies that are no longer located in New Mexico, and then 32 um, reported receiving New Mexico government incentives. The uh, the next page has has the jobs numbers. Uh, jobs at companies are at 3,752, and that's more than a thousand increase from last quarter's total jobs number. And and really, the recovery fund is is influenced in this number as the companies where the recovery fund is making loans to are larger, more established companies than we usually see from the venture capital funds, which will have smaller employee numbers. Um, the job growth increased to 1,095. Um, for comparison, last quarter's number was 617, so this also was a sizable increase. And this measures job growth since the New Mexico program's investment inception in these companies. And so a lot of it was driven by companies that, that are in the recovery fund that are now hiring more employees as, as we start coming out of COVID. The payroll is reported at 166.2 million, which was an increase of 33 million, and expenditures on New Mexico goods and services is reported at 203 million, which was an increase of about 55 million from from last quarter. Uh, the next slide is going into more detail of, of, of different aspects of the portfolio, but um, I wanted to conclude my remarks there and happy to answer any questions about the New Mexico program that the council may have. Thank you, Richard and David. Questions from Council? Hey, Richard, will you remind me, the, the payouts from the recovery fund, were those grants or low to no interest loans? What were those again? They, they were loans. Yeah, they're, they're loans. loans. So, so when we say gains, that's people, that's people paying back the loan or? That's, 
How do so, gains so the ga- the gains right now in the portfolio are coming from the fund investments and in, in, in venture capital. And so, you know, the big driver of the gain this quarter was there was a company that went public at a much higher value than it was previously held at. But we hope we hope to get a positive return from the recovery fund, so that would contribute to the gain, although we don't ex- anticipate the gain is going to be anywhere near what we anticipate from a venture capital fund. Madam Chair, if, if you prepay the loan in a, the recovery fund, you'll see most of that uh, in the quarterly distributions. Uh, rather than gains. Ah. Ah. And do we have folks prepaying? We actually uh, did have uh, two entities or less, I believe. Chris, do you recall? Yeah, some of, some of the companies have decided to prepay. Uh, the loan. So the loans are set up to be um, relatively low interest rates, flexible. Um, but they are secured um, in some fashion. Um, some of them are first lane. Some of them are second lane. Um, a lot of loans to uh, hotels that are often sitting behind. Uh, There's often second mortgages. Uh, the, 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 the whole program was set up to be flexible, reasonable price loans that are, are below market. And, uh, the idea is just was to provide flexibility for these companies to survive through COVID and uh, be able to pay us back once uh, the, the pandemic ended. Thanks, Chris. On to the that makes sense. Anything further on the New Mexico program? All right. With that, we're going to go to agenda item three, which is our investment voting matters. I think this is a good time uh, for me to transition away from chair. I'll be hopping off this call um, temporarily, but I will be back on uh, as soon as I'm able. I'm wondering if, Harold, are you uh, able to chair? Absolutely, uh, Madam Vice Chair. I, uh, Steve had prepared me uh, for this potentiality, and so I'll be happy to do that. Sounds good. I appreciate it. Thank you all. You betcha. Uh, this is, well, let's move to item 3A, and that can be real simple. Uh, the you, Everything we've covered so far today basically was the subject matter of the investment committee meeting. Once again, I'd like to remind the council that if you really want to get into significant detail on any of these investments or what we're doing or any of these PMRs, um, I think that uh, being at the investment committee meeting can really be helpful. Um, having said that, let's move right all let's move right along. Um, Paul, if you want to take away item three B, uh Berkshire Bridge Loan Investors two A. I got it. Thank you very much. Uh the materials for Berkshire Bridge Loan Investors two A, which is a mouthful, so I'll probably refer to it as BBLI two A, uh begin on page two twenty six of Diligent, and that starts with a staff cover memo. And before I get into my um, not-so-brief introductory comments here, I do want to introduce, we have two presenters from Berkshire on the line. They'll be speaking a little bit later after after Townsend, but David Olney, who's the CEO of Berkshire, and John Thiel, who's the Managing Director and Senior Portfolio Manager. So staff, in consultation with Townsend, recommends a commitment of up to $50 million to Berkshire Bridge Loan Investors 2A, for the SIC's financial assets allocation within the real return portfolio. A few minutes ago, Andrew presented the real return PMR, so I won't rehash that here other than to say that the $50 million investment is consistent with the real return investment policy constraints and objectives. BBLI 2A is a closed-end co-investment vehicle that will invest alongside Berkshire Bridge Loan Investors 2. SIC approved a $40 million commitment to BBLI-2 in February of 2021. The fund will originate first mortgage, whole loans, and will target a return of 11 to 13% net of fees. Um, Berkshire has gained so much market share with their BBLI-2 platform that they're running out of capital in the existing fund, so they're offering this interim vehicle to continue to invest until they launch BBLI-3, which will happen sometime next year. 
Uh, Berkshire is offering a substantial fee break to LPs committing to this interim fund. The cover memo prepared by staff and the Townsend in detail report show that SIC has a broad relationship with Berkshire, including $175 million of commitments, $110 million of NAD in our real estate portfolio, as well as $150 million uh, of commitments, which includes the proposed $50 million commitment, and about $42 million of NAD in our financial assets bucket. I do want to highlight that Townsend has rated this investment as qualified, and uh, uh, this is the same rating that they gave our original investment in uh, BBLI 2. The qualified rating is not as strong as the buy rating that we like, and Seth Marcus will discuss the rationale for that, uh, that rating. I don't want to presume that the CIC members or the SIC members have a deep understanding of the alphabet soup that is used to describe the commercial real estate debt securitization process. So I'll just spend a minute here giving a quick primer on the BBLI strategy. So you've all heard of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. These are, these are U.S. government-sponsored agencies that facilitate home ownership and rentership by providing reliable and affordable financing. Most stabilized multifamily properties are financed by one of these agencies. So leveraging Berkshire's relationships with the brokerage community and direct sourcing, Berkshire sources whole loans secured by multifamily properties that are in some form of transition, where the sponsor believes that better terms, such as higher proceeds, can be attained from the agencies or other permanent sources once a value creation process is completed. These loans are funded using a combination of fund equity and a warehouse line, uh, and the warehouse line funds approximately 75% uh, loan to value. Once Berkshire has accumulated a sufficient portfolio of loans, recently in the range of over a billion dollars, Berkshire affects a securitization wherein about 85% of the loan is sold off to a variety of investment-grade buyers, uh, debt buyers, and the remainder is retained by the fund. And I think it's worth looking at the graphic at the bottom of page two of the staff memo, page 27 of Diligent, which illustrates illustrates the origination and securitization process. Um, so on the left-hand side of that chart, you see that there is a loan originated um, where the borrower uh, in yellow has uh, about 30% equity, and a loan uh, is made, and in the example, we we're saying a loan is made at LIBOR plus 3.5%, but that's just for example. Um, and Berkshire lends up to 70% LTV or 72% LTV. Um, from that point, Berkshire will draw down on its warehouse financing, and they will. So we go to the middle of the middle of the chart. The borrower's equity is still that shown in yellow at the bottom. So the borrower still retains that 30% roughly equity cushion, and there is about 50% leverage placed on from the placed. On, through the warehouse line. So Berkshire retains that sliver between the 50 and 70% of loan to value. And then once the, there's a significant uh, pool of these assets built up, then it goes to a securitization. And the securitization, still we have the borrower equity in the range of, you know, 70, um, uh, in the range of 30%, basically that slice from 70% up to 100%. And you have the bond purchases purchasers owning the most senior parts of the debt, up to 60% loan to value, and Berkshire retaining this uh, slice in the middle, this mezzanine slice, 60 to 70% loan to value. And then you can see, if you read the detail here, how getting paid down to or getting retained that small slice um, allows them to earn a significant return, even though the loan pricing is still a LIBOR plus 350, because the bond investors are only getting LIBOR plus 175 in this example. Sorry for that, but um, I think that really helps demonstrate that there is always a significant cushion of borrower equity at the origination of these loans, and uh, consequently, values would have to fall very, very dramatically before um, the mezzanine has been imperiled. Uh, Berkshire Bridge Loan Investors 2A will focus on short duration floating rate loans with targeted average size of $40 million. Uh, the fund will target as-is loan value of roughly 
providing that 30% equity subordination that we just discussed. Staff believes that DVLI 2A is a good opportunity to invest alongside a trusted manager with a strategy that's performed well during COVID. All loans within DBLI 1 and 2 are current and without defaults, at least that was true as of about 10 days ago, at a discounted fee structure since existing investors receive a 50% discount off their BBLI 2A annual uh, investment management fee. Um, I'm going to stop there, I think, and turn it over to Seth, who will cover Townsend's underwriting of BBLI 2A. Thanks, Paul, and uh, good morning, everybody. So I'll, I'll do my best not to not to repeat anything that Paul said, but there is a there is a whole host of information in here on, on Townsend's memo, um, just behind the, the staff memo. So our materials begin. <coughs> excuse me, on page two thirty. I probably won't refer to many of the page numbers, but I'll, I'm happy to take questions after walking through some of our uh, my summary here. So. Um, as highlighted, this is Fund 2A, so I think it's important to note this is a co-investment follow-on vehicle to Fund 2 that we committed to in January. Um, Closed-end debt vehicle really focusing, focusing on originating whole loans for transitional multifamily assets, and I'll define that in a moment. Um, the billion-dollar target raise targets about 11% or, or in excess of 11% net returns to investors, um, utilizing up to 80% leverage but likely in the 70% range. This is a relatively short, um, short, um, term fund. So a three year investment period followed by a five year term. The, the thing I wanted to identify up front is that we will, as, as, as investors in fund two, New Mexico SIC will gain access to every deal in this fund already. But fund two A will invest, um, sort of co-invest in each of those deals. So Berkshire anticipates the two funds to invest really side by side on a pro rata basis for each of the transactions. And maybe at the risk of repeating some of Paul's comments, in terms of the strategy, uh, the fund will execute on direct lending of short duration, two to three year term floating rate senior mortgages um, to those transitional multifamily properties. So loans are typically underwritten to exit through that permanent Freddie Mac, Fannie Mae takeout financing upon completion of the business plan that Paul mentioned. And importantly, the fund will not lend on ground up development. So when I talk about transitional multifamilies, just focus on moderate renovation programs, newly built assets that are in lease up, and really have a direct line of sight to that to that Franny and Freddy, um, Freddy exit. Um, the fund does target an 11 to 13% net return. I state that again only because the return there is, um, is in, will, will entirely take, um, or entirely be a component of income. So 100% of that return will come from income. Um, as stated in Townsend's report, in order to achieve this level of return in, in, in a debt vehicle, the fund does take on additional risk of adding leverage um, after making those loans. So that's the approximately that 70% warehouse financing before securitization and um, that, that Paul mentioned. And I'll talk about this shortly, but Townsend does believe that this is the primary risk of the fund and why we, we qualify rated the fund versus a full buy rating. Um, before I do that, I just want to highlight a few other important benefits of the fund. Uh, we do believe Berkshire has a very strong sourcing advantage um, relative to their peers in the industry through their long-term industry presence, their brand, their expansive network of multifamily operators and owners. Um, this really leads to access to deal flow, particularly for sourcing loans to finance the, the acquisition of these transitional multifamily assets, which is really driven by the um, exclusive sourcing arrangement that they have with, with CBRE Capital Markets. This is really the largest multifamily lender for Freddie and Fannie um, uh, financings. Um, and it's also highlighted in the proof of concept. Um, in this, it, it, the desire here for Berkshire to raise an additional billion dollars of co-investment capital. Um, when we made our fund one, our, our fund two commitment in one Q to, to um, Berkshire Bridge Loan Fund two, um, we were buying into an existing season portfolio that had embedded value as approximately 60% committed at that time and generating cash yields in the 16% range. Um, and, and while early, these investments are projected to generate a 15% gross return over the, over the hold period. So the velocity of deal flow really continued throughout the year, which is the genesis for, for raising this follow-on vehicle. So maybe back to the point that I mentioned on leverage and Townsend's rating of the fund. So like all investments brought to the SIC for, for approval, Bridge Loan 2A was approved by Townsend's Investment Committee on a standalone basis as well as on behalf of New Mexico's Real Return Financial Assets Portfolio. 
However, he was given a qualified rating, and we've discussed a little bit of the differences on, on these ratings previously, and the definitions are in the, in the back of our materials. But importantly, both a buy rating and a qualified rating state that investment is suitable for, for institutional investors. However, we believe a qualified fund contains one or more heightened risks that should be considered um, before making a commitment. Importantly, um, we have at the SIC invested in qualified funds in the past, so our our prior commitment this year to, to Berkshire Bridge Loan 2 was qualified. We also committed to another debt fund, Aries Enhanced Income Fund, um, was a qualified fund for the same reason. It was, it was utilizing leverage within a debt vehicle. And also a fund we committed to in, in the early stages of the pandemic, Bell Fund 7, was a multifamily real estate fund that had existing exposure to assets in March of 2020 where, you know, there's a lot of unknown at that point in time, so we qualified that, rated that fund as well. Um, in the case of this vehicle um, and, and Fund 2 earlier this year, the underlying risk causing the, or, or resulting in a qualified rating is really that use of leverage on these debt investments to generate that 11% that plus return. About a third of the total return um, for, for, for the fund will be, can be attributed to leverage. And the risk when using leverage in this manner is that each debt facility is cross-collateralized and in most cases recourse to the fund. Um, additionally, each are subject to mark-to-market margin calls until the, the securitization occurs. So therefore, in the event of any loan defaults or a margin call is triggered, the fund may have to call capital to really defend that, that margin call, that mark-to-market uh, margin call. And if cash reserves are insufficient um, or advance rates are tapped out in the fund, um, then that's where the Berkshire will have to go to LPs to, to call additional capital. I think with that said, Berkshire has a very good track record in the structured finance space. As already mentioned, has, has executed quickly on, on three realizations already this year and has a fourth, uh, preparing a fourth as we speak, um, which will be the first securitization in this fund 2A. Um, this, this securitization really um, materially reduces the, this risk and, and, and hence why we, why we are recommending it today. Lastly, lastly, Berkshire really seeks to mitigate the need to call capital if a margin call were to occur, really by maintaining a sufficient level of cash reserves in the fund or in the individual investment. So, again, very well mitigated. Um, there's obviously a lot more details in our memo. The Berkshire guys have been very patient, and, and maybe I'll hand it over to them um, for the time being to let them present, and then happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Seth. Uh, this is David Only. I'm the CEO of Berkshire. I'd like to thank Paul and the rest of the Townsend team for their time and efforts. And on behalf of Berkshire, I'd also want to thank council and staff for having us back today. I'd like to express our gratitude for your ongoing support and for the substantial investments that Paul enumerated uh, that have happened across five of Berkshire's funds uh, so far to date. Uh, we place a high value on our relationship, and we're excited about this opportunity to further expand on the success we've enjoyed together over the past eight years. Um, before I turn it over to John File, who runs our debt platform, um, to talk about the co-investment strategy. I thought it might be helpful to take a few minutes to provide some quick organizational uh, facts and an update. And, Paul, you may want to help with the proper page reference. I had it as diligent 274, but I think it's less than that. It's the chart that uh, has trusted partner in the U.S. residential sector from our presentation. Okay, let me let me try to find that. Sorry about that. I'll begin. Um, uh, Berkshire uh, remains a privately held multifamily specialist with roughly now almost 700 employees staffed across five U.S. offices. Um, we That group provides deep operational expertise, and we've got over 543 dedicated property management professionals in-house because we do believe in having you know vertical integration with our asset investments. We also have 71 team members focused on investments and portfolio management. And today we steward over $13.6 billion on behalf of 132 global investors. Um, if the proper page reference, uh, national it, it, footprint. It's, two, it's 274 is the slide on the diligent page. Great. You're referring to it. Thank, you. Thank you. That was the one I was speaking to. And now I'm heading over to uh, 275 shows our national footprint. This gives you a sense of the breadth and depth of our market coverage. I think one of the things that makes Berkshire unique is this uh, breadth and depth. We have a track record and portfolio of operational data of over 301,000 units spread across 47 states, including uh, investments in New Mexico. 
We've made over 3,000 loan investments across our debt funds, inclusive of our K program and bridge loan programs, including almost $250 million in the state of New Mexico. Uh, the benefits of this extensive reach is that we have real-time access, and we have insight into operational data across all U.S. multifamily markets, which better informs our investment decision-making process. I think we're also unique in that we use our acquisition officers' knowledge of markets and underwriting to help assess debt investments. So they work across the risk spectrum from equity to debt. This approach, we believe, helps mitigate the front-end risk of the loan process by having those individuals who are involved in all of our investment activity actively engaged. If you turn to the next page, which would be 276, this provides an overview of the breadth of the multifamily investment solutions that Berkshire provides. Uh, this includes the five SIC invested funds, value funds three and four, Berkshire Core Fund, Debt Fund three, and Bridge Loan Investors two. Um, Berkshire has always taken a multifaceted approach to investing in U.S. Uh, we've got deep experience investing across the risk spectrum of core, core plus, and value add, and obviously throughout the capital stack in both debt and equity. Uh, to speak uh, specifically to the debt business and this opportunity, it's my, it's my pleasure to introduce my colleague, John File, who runs portfolio management for our debt investment team. John? Thanks, David, and thank you, everybody, for having us. Um, some of what I'll say will be um, reiterating a couple of things that Paul and Townsend said, so I'll try to be brief with some of those comments and also address a couple of the risks uh, that were identified. But as mentioned, this is the continuation of what has been a successful strategy for the Berkshire platform since we rolled it out in 2018. Uh, since that time, we've made over 200 investments or 200 loans, um, totaling over 10 or roughly $10 billion in total unpaid principal balance. Um, and happy to report that since that time, 100% of that book has been performing even during COVID, um, no defaults or missed payments, so certainly no credit losses to speak of. I'll get into it in a minute, but I think one of the hallmarks of this program is the attention to high quality institutional real estate in our underwriting process. Um, this is a co-investment vehicle, um, and we were, you know, we believe that there is um, an opportunity continues to exist to deploy this capital into this strategy based on several factors. Um, there exist uh, today uh, very solid multifam multifamily fundamentals throughout the United States, um, significant tailwinds in many markets that have been driving uh, both performance and investment activity. Uh, so an ability to invest in high quality loans um, um, with scale. Um, there are also uh, the capital markets right now, which uh, we execute this strategy through, are healthy and over the last year have truly recognized that multifamily is one of the least volatile asset classes in commercial real estate, which has worked to our favor in terms of our ability to execute, to execute efficient securitizations and drive returns uh, for the fund. And further, uh, there's been a natural maturation just of our bridge lending platform. Um, the um, relationship with CBRE was mentioned, and that has been very fruitful for us. And what we have seen now is um, a significant pickup and repeat business out as we're now into our third and fourth year of direct lending. Uh, we're starting to see sponsors who we've done business with in the past continue to come back with us, and that continues to drive increased investment activity. As mentioned, we're targeting returns um, 13 to 15% growth, which translates um, to about 200 basis points less on a net basis. All of that in the form of current income with the intent to make quarterly distributions of that income um, immediately. These are shorter investments, uh, three to five years, um, the underlying loan terms, that is, um, all indexed to floating rate. We have a very defined strategy and that strategy has been very consistent since 2018. Uh, this is a U.S. only, multifamily only, direct lending strategy on high quality institutional real estate. Um, 
within that, so that, that in and of itself relative to our peer, peers is uh, already defined, uh, but within that we further define it. Um, almost all of what we do is what we would consider traditional multifamily, uh, so very little exposure to some of the more volatile multifamily asset classes of student housing and senior housing. Um, almost all of what we do is senior mortgages, so secured by real estate. Less than 1% of what we've deployed has been in subordinate debt like mezzanine or preferred equity. Uh, as mentioned earlier, um, no exposure to construction risk. And I want to um, you know, make a point that although these assets are in transition, uh, they are not in distress. These are typically assets that are being acquired by institutional sponsors who see value in the assets um, and are driving value either through a value-add renovation program, so improving you know, the interiors of the units and the common areas through capital expenditures, or pre-stabilized assets which are newly constructed uh, and going through their initial lease-up. So in either case, performing assets, but just uh, cash flows that have not yet been optimized uh, to take on that permanent financing. We are always looking at our underwriting with the eye towards an exit to a Fannie Mae or a Freddie Mac refinance. Uh, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac are the largest providers of multifamily liquidity in the United States. They also have the most predictable um, underwriting guidelines. Those guidelines for Fannie and Freddie haven't changed in roughly 30 years. So we believe we can mitigate significantly our exit risk with these loans by underwriting them to those standards, and that's what we do. Um, and it's a moderate leverage program. Uh, our weighted average loan to value is somewhere around 72%. Uh, we can go up to 80%, but oftentimes are much lower than that. Um, with the increased investment activity that we've had over the past 18 months, which has led us to this co-investment capital raise, uh, we've stuck very uh, very closely to that strategy um, and have not, quote unquote, reached for yield or reached for product in order to achieve uh, both the yield and the investment volumes um, that we have, have achieved. Uh, as I mentioned, our, our loan to value has not moved um, at 72 to 73%. 95% um, of what we do is traditional multifamily and 99% of what we've deployed to date has been in those senior secured mortgages. Um, so those are not just targets, those are actual numbers um, that the program has stuck to over time. And as I mentioned, no losses or defaults in the nearly $10 billion book. I think one of the things that differentiates us from our peers, and David touched on this, is the, the fact that Berkshire is a vertically integrated multifamily platform. So we are lending on these strategies but at the same time have decades of experience owning and operating assets with these same types of business plans. Um, so not only could we have the ability to take over an asset if for some reason there was an issue with one of our bridge loans, but I think more importantly, we have a unique ability to assess the risk while we're screening these investments to understand whether or not you know, it's an appropriate risk to take and we rely heavily on that vertically integrated platform, the folks who are involved in our equity investment business, the folks that are involved in our property management business to help make those credit decisions for us. And I think that makes us a more informed lender. Um, I'm on page 280 of the deck. Um, one of the unique aspects of this investment as well will be its rapid deployment. Uh, I think as Paul mentioned, we already have our first securitization targeted for January of 2022, so in just about a month and a half. That'll be a roughly $2 billion securitization, which would allow um, New Mexico to deploy roughly somewhere between 20 to 30 percent of its equity commitment in the co-investment vehicle almost immediately. Um, and we believe that there's the ability to deploy the remainder of that capital um, uh, throughout 2022. Uh, moving to page 281, I think this just represents um, 
the, the growth of the platform and our loan originations. And as was mentioned earlier, a lot of that is driven through this unique relationship that we have with CBRE. Uh, CBRE is one of the largest providers or intermediaries of capital um, for Fannie and Freddie in their multifamily programs. Um, as a lender that's targeting um, Fannie Freddie quality loans, um, there's no better firm to do business with than CBRE uh, to bring us those types of opportunities. Moving to page 282, all of this has led our lending brand, which we call MF1, um, much more marketable to call us MF1 than, uh, as Paul mentioned, the mouthful, which is Berkshire Bridge Loan Investors 2 or 2A. Uh, so the world knows us as MF1. Um, and as you can see here in these league tables, um, we have cemented our position both with sponsors but also with bond investors as a, a leading provider of this type of finance um, in the United States. So moving to page 283, and this is where I might touch on uh, the capital markets risk that was um, highlighted by, by Townsend. Um, the risk um, for the strategy is once you make a loan, um, your ability to get it to a securitization and into a securitization quickly uh, mitigates your risk. Once a loan has been securitized, that is a structure that is locked in. Um, and remains with that loan throughout its life. So therefore, that risk of securing that return has been drastically reduced. So it's incumbent or it's important for us to execute those securitizations with regularity. Um, about halfway down the page of 283, we show a statistic which is our weighted average aggregation period. That represents the number of days on average that a loan is on a warehouse line prior to its inclusion in a securitization. And as you can see, as the platform has grown, that number has gone down significantly to the point where these loans are on a warehouse line for less than two months. Um, so our ability to drive high investment volumes allows us to aggregate these pools of loans quickly and avoid um, elongated market risks. And what it also allows us to do is pivot and move our, our pricing on our loans with the market um, so that we're not sitting with a portfolio of loans that's been seasoned for six months and is therefore mispriced. Um, hey, John, it's we also call Chapman cutting in here. Um, uh, sure. Chairman Lavender, acting chairman, um, are you okay if we cut off John's presentation at this point and go to q and I don't, I don't want to short circuit anything, but I know you've got other matters to get to here. I think that would be fine, and I think this has been really instructive, but I think it's probably a good idea to kind of move on. I think that um, we've had a good uh, – we had a really good vetting of this at the investment committee, and I think it would be a good idea to move on. That's not really to shortchange the uh, presentation, but I think we can move forward. No, much appreciated. Thank you. Uh, this is Jennings. I have one little question. Is there any effect on any of these properties with the COVID stuff where people were told they didn't have to pay their rents or their mortgages or whatever? That, that has been marked. Oh, sorry, Paul. Yeah, I was going to say you should take this. Sure. Yes, that, that has been, uh, I would say, market-specific at this point. There really aren't any rent moratoriums. Um, early on in COVID, there were in um, especially some of the larger urban markets like New York City and Los Angeles and San Francisco. That is an effect that we don't see today. Um, one thing that I think would express uh, the lack of that as an issue in our portfolio is I believe in the 200 plus loans that we've originated, I think we might have had three sponsors approach us with a request for forbearance. Um, and we have no sponsors currently that are in any type of forbearance, meaning just any type of relief because their their tenants weren't paying. Okay, uh, you know the thing, I mean it's like it's almost risk free. Uh, I mean almost. Anyway, thank you. Thank you. Other questions?
anything further? Mr. Chair, this is Tim. And I, and I guess I have one for you, uh, Harold, because you said you vetted this quite well in, in committee. Um, what's the downside? I think what do that, you see as a downside? I think that, I, uh, as was alluded to earlier, I think from my perspective, I always get a little bit um, concerned about leverage. But it seems to me that they've answered that question pretty well. So I don't see a whole lot of downside here. Uh, relative to the experience of, 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 of the company. Uh, uh, I think that the uh, Berkshire's track record has been so good that I think that I, I think the whole idea when we took a look at this at the investment committee was that based, you know, you obviously have to temper a little bit of what you think based on what's, what the potential in the future is. But I think Berkshire's track record's been pretty darn good, and I think that it's not over leveraged, and I think it, I think it's pretty, uh, this is pretty solid, and I think that that was the way that Mike and uh, Nick felt when we vetted this at the committee. Yeah, and I, I would just Thank add you. that. You know, comments that that, um, that both John and Seth have already made. I, I, I think that, um, in, in my view, getting these these loans off the warehouse line and into a syndication. Um, the, the faster that process goes, the less exposure you have to a dramatic change in interest rates where your loan is suddenly out of market. And Berkshire has demonstrated they've got this tremendous flow of transactions that they're able to get the, security, the, the securitizations done, the loan source, the warehouse funded, and then the securitization done within a matter of really days. Um, I don't know, John, is it like 60 days you can basically do that whole process? Um, so I think the real risk here is something, not the failure of a particular property, but it's really something that would be more in the nature of a, of a GFC where there is just a, a fundamental uh, breakdown in, in values. And, uh, and it would have to be quite substantial because, as we've discussed, you know, both Seth and, and myself and John, there's a significant equity cushion um, – behind you that stays in place all through the syndication process. Seth, anything you want to add add to that? No, I think Paul, you covered it. I think the, the, maybe maybe I'll add one 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 piece there. So look, the execution of the securitization is the is is a, is a risk, and the shorter the time frame and the track record that the Berkshire has experienced is strong. Um, but and, and to Paul's point, the other risk there is if you know. We are in the first loss position when we look at the leverage. If you look at that chart that Paul was describing, where the equity behind the equity is really the first loss, and then we're the first loss on the on the on the, on the debt. Um, so, if values did decrease to the point of the global financial crisis, or even or, or even somewhere in, you know somewhere between that and, and, and a typical downturn, our loan could be at risk of of non-payment. Um, but again. Where we see multifamily today, and I think that's that's where we're, why we're comfortable, and we think the risks are well mitigated. That you know valuations of multifamily on a quarterly basis have been, to, to be frank, pretty astounding. The, the increase in values, and, and and we see continued strong fundamentals both on the supply and demand side um, for for multifamily going forward. So also mitigating that that concern. Treasurer Eichenberg, does that address your question adequately? Yes, it did. Thank you. Okay. Anything further? Um, I actually misspoke a moment ago. Uh, Nick couldn't be at the investment committee meeting, and Mike had to leave early. So John and I were able to go through this, and we agreed that these, uh, this particular investment and the next two, uh, we liked each of them. Um, are there any further questions or issues here uh, about this particular investment? If not, John is John. Member Bingaman is going to make the motions. Sure. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Um, so uh, based on the recommendations of the Council Investment Committee, Advisor Townsend Group, SSC staff, General Fiduciary Oversight of RBK, I move the State Investment Council approve a commitment of up to $50 million to Berkshire Bridge Loan Investors 2A, subject to and contingent upon New Mexico legal requirements, New Mexico State Investment Council policies, negotiation of final terms and conditions, and completion of appropriate paperwork. Is there a second? I'll second. 
Okay. I think we got Mike and Tim. Uh, looks sounded like, uh, let's say, Mike, thank you. Uh, any further discussion? Andy, would you please call the roll? Governor Lujan Grisham. Hi, Grisham. Commissioner Garcia Richard. Secretary Romero. Yes. Treasurer Eichenberg. Yes. Mr. Lavender. Yes. Mr. Rawson. Yes. Mr. Jennings. Yes. Mr. Messina. Yes. Mr. Tayas. Yes. Ms. Allen. Mr. Bingaman. Yes. Mr. Chairman, the motion carries eight to zero. Thank you very much. I uh, appreciate that. And uh, thank you, Berkshire, for your presentation. And uh, we uh, uh, look forward to uh, a lot of success. Uh, let's move on to 3C, Bain Capital. Uh, and that would be with uh, David Lee and Mercer. Thank you all thank very you. much, David. Only I'll be exiting. Happy uh, Thanksgiving and happy holidays. Right back at you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Mr. Chair. Uh, this is David Lee. I'm here with Chris Cassidy on the staff, uh, Richard Pugmire and Amy Ridge of Mercer, and our guests from Bain Capital, uh, the Managing Director uh, in the Tech Ops Group, Darren Abrahamson, and the Managing Director in Investor Relations, Steve Radakovich. These materials uh, start on page, uh, diligent page 308. Uh, it's the usual format with a staff memo, uh, the MUSA report, and then followed by a, a presentation on Bain Capital Tech Ops. The Tech Opportunities Fund strategy will focus on mid-market buyouts and late-stage growth investments. So the buyout and growth mix will introduce both control and minority transactions. The fund will focus primarily on North American companies and will pursue investments in technology and technology-enabled businesses, specifically the priority industries of application software, infrastructure and security, uh, fintech and payments, healthcare IT, and opportunistically internet and digital media. Bain Tech Ops 2 will be a concentrated strategy with a target of 10 to 15 companies in the fund, and the target size of the fund is $1.5 billion. The general partner commitment here will likely be $150 million, so well above average, which we obviously like to see for alignment purposes. And the check size for each investment will be between $50 million and $250 million. Historically, Bain Capital funds have been very difficult to access, and staff and consultant believe that Bain is and would continue to be a very strong long-term partner. This is the second fund in the Tech Opportunities Series, but Bain has a long 30-plus year track record of successful technology investing with very low loss ratios. It is uh, a bit too early to judge Fund One's track record, since it's fairly recent, but it is off to an outstanding start. For this fund, uh, there are 22 dedicated employees, uh, plus four members of the portfolio group, and they're located in Baines, Boston, and San Francisco offices. And some staff and consultants are recommending a commitment of up to $60 million in Bain Tech Opportunities II, and this would be the third commitment to Bain Capital. Uh, we made a $50 million commitment to Tech Opportunities I and a $50 million commitment to Bain 13 so far. With that, I will turn it over to Mercer for additional comments. Thank you, David. That was a that was a good summary of the of the fund. So I'll just focus on some of the conclusions from our from our memo where we summarized some of the the pros and considerations of the fund. Um, as a reminder, the council's reviewed two different Bain funds in the past: this fund strategy and also the main private equity fund. And, and Bain has a strong private equity platform across multiple funds. The firm is showing its support for this strategy by committing a large portion to the fund. It's five times larger than what we usually see, 
And this really creates a strong alignment between the Bain team and investors because they're putting a large portion of their money into the fund. The team managing this fund has strong backgrounds in technology. Two of the managing directors have long tenures at Bain in the technology sector, and the, and the third managing director was previously a partner at Hellman and Friedman, who has a strong reputation of making technology investments and is also a manager in your, your portfolio as well. The strategy is going to be consistent with the last fund, and we like the flexibility of pursuing growth equity minority investments in companies or more traditional control-oriented buyouts. It allows the team to see a wider universe of opportunities. Bain has a portfolio group that's actively involved in assisting portfolio companies with value creation initiatives. There are four members of that team focused on the tech ops platform. And we really like this aspect of the strategy because we like strategies focused on creating better companies. Right now, we're in an environment where prices are high, so the team can seek strategic initiatives with companies or operational improvements or even add on acquisitions of, of companies at lower prices to improve a company's market position. I think this is one of the real advantages of this fund is they can utilize the larger Bain platform, which would be difficult to duplicate for a standalone group trying to raise a fund of, of similar size. On the consideration front, um, this still, still is a newer fund strategy within Bain, although, as David mentioned, the organization has a long history of investing in the technology sector. And as I previously mentioned, compared to a new firm that would start a similar strategy, this management team will be able to utilize the existing resources of the Bain organization, both, both on the uh, investment strategy and then also the back office. The strategy also fits well in the organization as they'll focus on investments that fall between the venture and the buyout funds. Fund one still early in its life, but has already had some signs of success. Um, it's at a 1.4 times net multiple and 74% net IRR as of June 30th. And subsequent to June 30th, which was the date of performance in, in our report, the fund sold its first company to a strategic acquirer and, and generated a favorable return. We also looked at potential conflicts in the platform with, with other funds that also target technology within Bain. The funds all have different targets around investment size or company stage, which helps determine which fund invests in which company. And we haven't seen many crossover investments so far. There's, there's only been one. But if there is overlap with other funds, Bain has an allocation committee consisting of senior personnel that will review to determine an equitable allocation. From a fund terms perspective, um, Bain is offering two choices on fund terms this time. One has a higher management fee and a lower carried interest, and the second has a lower management fee and a higher carried interest. We like the higher management fee and lower carried interest option because if the form, if the fund performs how we hope it does, you would want a lower profit sharing because that's likely going to lead to higher net returns uh, at the end of the fund. We're, we're recommending an up to $60 million commitment to Bain Capital Tech Opportunities too. And with that, uh, I'll turn it over to the Bain team, uh, Steve Radakovich and Darren Abrahamson. Thank you, everyone. This is Darren Abramson, And first of all, appreciate the opportunity to present to the council and um, and just want to say that uh, David and, and Chris have been terrific partners for us, and, and the Mercer team has been, uh, been wonderful to work with as well um, on the first fund and, and in this process. Um, I'll try to keep my remarks relatively brief and just touch on um, areas that maybe weren't covered in, in the helpful introduction. Overall, as we look back, uh, we're quite pleased with how things have progressed with, with the fund. Um, we are early, but we have scaled the team quite significantly to – uh, as David mentioned, roughly 25 people um, across the investing and the portfolio operations and value creation side, and importantly spent a significant amount of time as a team um, on, on really training our people on our strategy and our sourcing approach and sort of the, the bar of diligence that is really a hallmark of, of Bain Capital's history and DNA. Uh, and as a result, I believe we truly have a world-class team that is quite differentiated in the eyes of the founders and the management teams that we interact with in the marketplace. From a strategy perspective, I believe that we have proven our thesis that an engaged and active partner can be quite differentiated in this segment of the market, and that by leveraging all of the benefits of the Bain Capital platform, as well as our approach, approach to value creation, that that really resonates with the companies that we're interacting with, and in many cases, uh, drives opportunistic um, outcomes for us. 
uh, as we approach the end of fund one, that has translated into a portfolio that while early, uh, we feel is very much in line with our expectations in terms of backing market leading companies in sectors where we have deep expertise, where we also have strong alignment around how we can help those companies grow and scale. So it's not just about capital, it's about helping these companies think through strategy and operations, M&A opportunities, uh, how they can really expand their go-to-market and ultimately build bigger, better, higher value companies uh, because of all of that. And in every one of our investments to date, there are clear reasons as to why we were chosen um, as their partner of choice uh, as, as they evaluated the, the other investment opportunities out there. Um, all of that has, has translated into, um, frankly, quite attractive relative entry multiples, despite what we have seen, obviously, in terms of tech valuations broadly across our industry and, and the broader market. Um, and that has been combined with very strong company performance out of the gate. As mentioned, we've had one early exit successfully, um, but effectively all of our companies are either on or, or ahead of our underwriting plans, and we are actively engaged and driving value in the form of improved talent, uh, targeted acquisitions, pricing strategies, and the like. And we feel strongly that this is a winning combination. If we can continue to find companies where we've got deep understanding of the markets, we believe they're the emerging winners in these categories, um, we can buy in at relatively favorable multiples because of the sourcing efforts and the, the benefits of the Bain Capital platform, and then really help drive value that that creates uh, a lot of upside in, in the portfolio and the fan, and uh, we expect to see that um, be, be uh, delivered over time. Um, as relates to Fund 2, we have really no change in strategy. Um, the fund will be slightly bigger, largely to just enable us to hold slightly more equity in the, in the same size deals that we've been pursuing. Um, fund one was intentionally constrained slightly as a first fund and as we were scaling the team, but now that we've got the team up and running, um, but no change to the verticals we're targeting, to the concentration approach of the companies, to the size and stage of companies. Uh, we like the segment of the market that we're in, and we believe that we will continue to find interesting opportunities um, and be able to really help these companies grow and scale. Uh, so with that, I appreciate the time, and I will open it up for Q&A. Are there any questions? David, do you have anything further? No, I think that sums it up. We'll be happy to answer any questions, though. We've had good uh, relationship with Bain, and uh, once again at the Investment Committee, we discussed this and listened to uh, the proposals. And I think that uh, we uh, recommended approval of this. Uh, if there's nothing further or any questions, John? Sure, Mr. Chairman. Uh, so based on the recommendations of the Council Investment Committee, Private Equity Advisor Mercer, SIC staff, and General Fiduciary Oversight of RBK, I move the State Investment Council approve a commitment of up to $60 million to Bain Capital Tech Opportunities Fund 2 LP, Subject to and contingent upon New Mexico legal requirements, New Mexico State Investment Council policies, negotiation of final terms and conditions, and completion of appropriate paperwork. That's great. Thank you. Is there a second, please? Tim seconds. Okay. Member Jennings seconded. Uh, it's been moved and seconded that we approve this investment. Is there any further discussion? If not, Andy, would you please call the roll? Governor Lujan Grisham. Commissioner Garcia Richard. Secretary Romero. Yes. Treasurer Eichenberg. Yes. Mr. Lavender. Yes. Mr. Rawson. Yes. Mr. Jennings. Yes. Mr. Messina. Yes. Mr. Tejas. Yes. Ms. Allen. Mr. Bingaman. Yes. Mr. Chairman, the motion passes 8-0. to zero. Uh, Once again, thank you very much. Thank you, Bain. Thank you, David. Um, I think, uh, once again, good luck. Um, look forward to success. Uh, let's move on to item 3D. Thank you all. D. You bet. Uh, to item 3D, and uh, this is kind of a, more of a, a little bit more of an administrative thing, but uh, let's turn this over to Vince to bring us up to speed. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Um, yeah, we can, we can wrap this up uh, fairly quickly, I think. Uh, in your book, uh, oh, from me uh, to the to the CIC, I guess we should have re, redid that to the SIC because this memo is intended for you. 
Um, I've got page 400 of the materials that, that uh, Andy sent out last week. Um, we've been talking for quite some time about the, uh, about the, the pile up of, in cash in the portfolio. One thing I do want to point out is in the performance reports um, uh, that RBK puts together in the land grant, we list um, the cash that we have under the cash line there. It's a little over 5% in their line. That that cash, just be aware, and, and we've, we've talked about this uh, uh, in prior meetings, that cash is overlaid with uh, with uh, uh, futures, pr primarily treasuries, but uh, but uh, also some international equity. So that money is actually invested. Uh, it's just done with the overlay program and in the derivatives markets uh, rather than in the physical markets. Uh, but that's it's more or less of an aside to this memo. Um, we've got limits, as you know, uh, to each of the asset classes about uh, how, how much, you know, allocation we'll have in that. So we have a target allocation and then a range around each of those, those allocations. Uh, page two of the memo shows uh, land grants, average tobacco and water, um, those those four funds, uh, their target allocation to fixed income and the upper and lower ranges as exists in policy. Uh, once we get outside of a range uh, that's established in policy, policy direction to us is to get it back within the range uh, in a prudent manner. So, so there's no real time limitation um, or methodology um, prescription to get you know, to get a weight back within its within its range. Um, typically, we can get these back quickly. A month or two is all it takes. If it's pr one of the private asset classes, it may take just a little bit longer to you know get capital called and uh, or, or returned as the as the um, as the uh, limit violated. You know, um, but typically we can do it fairly quickly. I'm forecasting that I don't think, and we're outside the bands now in, in fixed income, of course, with all the cash that we've, we've uh, uh, accumulated. I just don't see us getting back in that range in sort of a natural way. In other words, uh, capital calls start increasing a bit relative to, to return uh, or the uh, income from the land office slows. Forecast there. Uh, and the land office forecast there as this continues for a while. So what I'm suggesting, suggesting to you in this memo is that we increase the ranges for fixed income. Um, we're, we're within the four percentage points that I'm, I'm recommending here, uh, both up and down for, for each of the funds. And I, I think we can manage uh, well enough with that increase. So, so right now in the policy, we've got 2% uh, ranges around the, the targets. Uh, I'm suggesting to you that we go to four percentage point ranges around the target. That, that also is on page two in the second table. Shows you what the upper and lower bands would be. There's just one exception. That's in the water fund. Uh, I've only re reduced the lower band there to three percentage points, down to five percent. The main reason there is just in a theoretical basis. Um, uh, allocating less than 5% to any asset class uh, um, re really removes any, you know, material impact it can have on the portfolio. So just from a theoretical basis, we keep that at 5, which is sort of a, a minimum allocation. Uh, but otherwise, 4 percentage points around the targets. Uh, I think, again, I think this will let us manage the excess cash we have, you know, until that situation resolves itself, uh, which, which I'm not really forecasting to be really in the next year or so, so I think a change in the bands uh, is the way to go. Uh, but with that, Mr. Chairman, uh, happy to answer any questions or have any discussion you'd like to have. Any uh, further questions? This uh, simply gives us a certain more flexibility, and I think that's really important. Uh, any questions or issues about this issue? If not, Mr. Bingerman. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Um, based on the recommendations of the Council Investment Committee, SSC staff, and General Fiduciary Oversight of RBK, I move that the State Investment Council amend the investment policy to increase the maximum minimum limits in core fixed income to four percentage points from target for the present two percentage points from target for the Land Grant Permanent Fund, Seven Sacks Permanent Fund, and Tobacco Settlement Permanent Fund, and three percentage points below target for a minimum and four percentage points above target for the maximum for the Water Trust Fund, as discussed and memorialized by the Council today. Thank you. Uh, is there a second? I'll second. Okay. Uh, I think that was Mike. Thank you. 
Um, Andy, would you, if any further discussion? Andy, would you please call the roll? Governor Lujan Grisham. Commissioner Garcia Richard. Secretary Romero. Yes. Treasurer Eichenberg. Yes. Mr. Lavender. Yes. Mr. Rawson. Yes. Mr. Jennings. Yes. Mr. Messina. Yes. Mr. Teas. Yes. Ms. Allen. Mr. Bingaman. Yes. Mr. Chairman, the motion passes eight to zero. Thank you very much, and thank you, council members, uh, for uh, these for carrying these motions forward. Um, let's move right on to 4A, uh, Brent. Yes, uh, Mr. Chairman, I'll be brief. I'm on page uh, 402. Just uh, a couple of things to point out on uh, uh, this page. I item number three, uh, you might be wondering about agreed upon procedures. Uh, we're, we're just wrapping up the audit. Uh, it's been submitted. Uh, agreed upon procedures for the uh, first quarter of the fiscal year ending September and the quarter ending in December. Those are typically done together uh, because of the timing of the audit. So the auditors will be starting on that in the near future. And then um, I did want to mention, and I think uh, Nick will have other things to say, but we did have an exit conference with Moss Adams on the 16th uh, related to our most uh, recent audit report for fiscal year 21. Uh, it says here that the report will be filed by the 24th. Actually, the day after our exit conference, it was filed. Uh, and for everybody's uh, uh, kind of a reminder to everybody, they, they have a little while to look at it. DFA reviews it. The state auditor uh, reviews it. We've been in contact with our analyst at DFA uh, regarding some questions. We have to submit entries, et cetera. So we're in the process of getting all that wrapped up uh, as far as questions from DFA and the state auditor. We are not expecting any uh, problems uh, with the audit report. All, all the questions uh, thus far have been fairly routine, and we're optimistic that all this is going to be closed out very favorably. Other than that, uh, I think Nick might have uh, some comments on the exit conference. If not, I, I can do that as well. Nick? Hey, thanks, Brent. And uh, Yeah, let me just jump in, Nick, and you, if you and Brent will just take care of the next two. Thank you. Okay. Um, Brent, were you going to do budget projections? Or yeah, I, I, uh, Nick, I, I really didn't have uh, too much to say on those. I think as I've uh, commented uh, in the past, I think we're likely, uh, just because of the run-up in uh, the market, we're likely before the end of the fiscal year to have to go out and, and do a bar, but we're kind of waiting to see how uh, that shakes out on the uh, investment holdings report. Usually I comment on that last page, especially uh, comment on the contributions from the land office. That's already been covered, so really don't have much to add there. So uh, to add a little bit of uh, additional time for the exit conference, I figure I'd uh, keep the rest of the presentation fairly short. Great. So um, I can talk, take it from there and chat a little bit about the audit committee and our meeting on uh, the 16th. We did meet uh, to discuss the exit conference. Uh, with Moss Adams, we, we talked with Corey Hogan and Aaron Hamilton uh, regarding the the, the uh, audit. And uh, just want to remind the, the council that all the audit efforts really start um, back in July. Uh, obviously, a pretty extensive process to uh, get everything in order to meet all of the different audit requirements and uh, have that report turned in by the 24th of November, which is required by uh, the audit rule, I believe. Um, everything uh, went well with the audit in terms of our conversation. Um, the Moss Adams was planning on issuing the audit report in reference to the financial statements of the New Mexico State Investment Council. 
um, and they would also issue the uh, government auditing standards report on internal re control over the financial reporting, which is incredibly important. And um, during our exit conference, we did have a very, very in-depth and robust conversation on the controls in place to safeguard the assets of the SIC. Uh, this, this is uh, obviously very, very important to all of us. And uh, so we dug in with the auditors on that subject and uh, they were able to communicate that they do uh, provide a very rigorous um, inquiry into the different areas of, of those requirements related to checks and balances, internal control. Uh, you know, they spoke with me uh, in person on, uh, you know, anything that would relate to knowledge of fraud um, with what uh, happens with the operations. And obviously, I was very happy to report I have no uh, knowledge of that at all whatsoever. Um, we also discussed how they do work with our bank and, and uh, some of our um, – uh, some of the, uh, you know, the, the, the folks that we work with under contract um, to just provide inquiries into how things are handled and, um, and making sure that the standards are all, um, you know, basically adhered to uh, with those relationships. And so, um, you know, it gave, up, gave me a lot of confidence in terms of how the funds are managed and, and also how they are controlled, and Brent and his team do a really good job of making sure there's proper separation of duties on, uh, um, you know, different transactions and that no one person has uh, uh, excessive um, authority or control to, to administer uh, things that would put the funds at risk. So that was an excellent um, conversation that we had. And, uh, you know, we, we discussed a couple of new pronouncements from the uh, Governmental Accounting Standards Board, that's the GASB rules that we have to adhere to. Um, one of the pronouncements was GASB Rule uh, 84, which talks about the, 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 the accounting for agency funds and fiduciary funds, and um, it's kind of a more of a technical accounting treatment, but... Uh, we do have to uh, follow some new rules in terms of, of classifying those funds as fiduciary funds, and some of the the uh, impact is in and around our uh, trust fund that we have. Uh, there's nothing financially impactful. It's just the accounting treatment on those areas. And so, um, you know, we were happy to, to talk uh, in depth about that, as well as uh, new rules related to leases and how um, – the accounting for leases has to be handled, uh, which really doesn't apply to the SIC that much, but uh, it's important that we review those things uh, in the audit committee. And um, other than that, we had uh, really good conversations. Again, uh, the audit went really well. Rented his team was um, exceptional at making sure the auditors have timely information on uh, – you know, gathering all of the in-depth information, which is, which is, you know, with $35 billion um, and the transactions related to that, it's an incredible feat that they are able to get through it, especially under uh, sort of COVID and, and the challenges that that um, places on, on our staff. And, uh, and so, again, kudos and much appreciation go out to Brent. Uh, the accounting team, and uh, all of the SIC members. With that, we can stand for any questions. And, Brent, Brent if you have anything to add on, go, go right ahead. I, I really don't have uh, too much other than to say this, this has been the uh, second year in a row that we have had no, no visits from the auditors. The, auditors. the audit was completed completely remotely, and – uh, the fact that we were to, you know, we were able to get it filed a week ahead of time uh, says a lot about uh, uh, the accounting department and the other people involved in the audit. And I just wanted to thank everybody, uh, especially my uh, accounting manager, uh, Nicole Gallegos. She's uh, exceptional, and 
uh, very good at responding to inquiries from the auditors in a timely manner. And uh, I, I couldn't say uh, enough things about her and, and the staff. I really appreciate it. And uh, any other questions, uh, I'm happy to answer those. The audit report likely is to be finalized, and I'll be getting everybody copies probably for the January meeting. Uh, up until then, it's, it's being reviewed and, and going through that process, but that's all I have, uh, uh, Member Tejas, uh, unless you have something else you want me to say. Yeah, just to emphasize that we do have to wait till the state auditor releases our audit publicly and gives us the um, the, the go-ahead to uh, uh, go ahead and release that, and so there's still a little bit of time, but um, we did – we did complete the, uh, the exit conference portion, and the audit was submitted uh, by the deadline. So it's a big stage in the whole uh, pro process that, you know, again goes back to maybe June, July. And so it's a very in-depth uh, – it's, it's a lot of in-depth work over a long period of time. So that's Thank it. you. Nick, Brent, thank you both very much. Um, I, for one, as a member of the council – Really appreciate the professionalism that this, uh, that you guys bring to this. And Brent, you and your staff deserve a special thanks for, uh, doing things correctly and doing it right. So, cause audits can really be something. So thank you both very much. Any, if no other questions or issues there, let's move on to closing matters. Um, any old or new business? Yes. I'm, I'm sorry, Mr. Chair. This is Secretary Romero. Um, I, I think um, somebody mentioned a possibility of uh, may have to do a bar sometime in the future. Um, just want to remind uh, staff that there's a bar moratorium that um, goes into effect it's December 17th, and then it doesn't end until after the 20-day uh, uh, bill signing period, uh, which is March 11th. So if you do think you need a bar, it's got to be done either before or after March 11th. Uh, Secretary Romero, uh, thank you for the reminder. I think they recently uh, sent out a reminder as well, which I appreciate. If we were to do a bar, it would uh, definitely be after the session, but, but thank you so much for the reminder. Okay. Uh, any other old or new business? Um, I have something I'd like to, you know, I read the article in the paper about the settlement. Uh, I wonder, Evan or Steve, could you talk a little bit about uh, this uh, the recent uh, settlement in uh, the lawsuit. Uh, sure, this is Evan. Is, 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 unless Steve would like to comment first, I'm I'm happy to go. So there is an article in the Albuquerque Journal today referencing a settlement by the Attorney General's office, and the lawsuit that was settled is an Attorney General lawsuit. Uh, related to some, some big banks and some practices that they, uh, the attorney generals around the country, uh, felt were, um, improper with the respect to how they handled transactions. Uh, we were not particularly involved with the settlement other than supporting the attorney general's efforts. Uh, the, the settlement, the lawsuit was settled very early. Uh, I don't think anyone's responded to the complaints yet with these seven large banks um, and um, it's part of the attorney general's authority to represent the state of New Mexico as sort of the top civil as well as criminal but in this case civil litigator in terms of what they what they deem as in consumer protection in the public interest uh, they used uh, New York firm as their plaintiff's counsel and um, have sort of administered that case as they deem in the best interest of the state. So we will probably be the beneficiary of some inflows related to that, but it is uh, sort of all uh, operational and credit uh, on this one is part of the Attorney General's office, it's not our, our team of lawyers or our in-house people. Thank you very much. Uh, any comments or questions about that? I want to remind everyone that our next SIC meeting is Tuesday, January 25th. Uh, there'll be an investment committee meeting a couple of weeks before that. Um, I also uh, would like to take this time to wish everyone happy Thanksgiving and happy holidays. 
I know we've got, uh, and now that we don't meet again until January, we won't be talking to each other before the Christmas or the holiday season. And I hope everybody has a really good one. Um, any other issues about that? You know, uh, yeah, happy Turkey Day. But, you know, you ever think about what would happen if we use Ron Bell or somebody, the gross receipts tax on some of that lawsuit might be pretty good. <laughs> I start thinking about using our own people. You got it, Tim. Uh, you got it. Um, let me ask you this, Charlie. Do we have any public comments? We did receive one, Mr. Chairman. Uh, it comes from Daniel Pritchard. Uh, his comment is this. The minutes to be approved at today's SIC meeting from October 26, 2021, do not include the discussion that took place last meeting regarding the Renewable Energy Investment Strategic Plan. Is there a reason for that? Daniel Pritchard, Renewables House. I think we'll have to reach okay. out and maybe um, see what he's referring to. Um, one other item, Mr. Chairman, this comes from me. Um, I do want to let the council know that earlier today, prior to the, getting to the investment items, the webcast did have a uh, technical issue. Uh, we were able to work around it and get back up. Um, the full meeting audio will be posted as soon as it's available. That's all, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Thank you, Charlie. Uh, Steve or Vince, anything further before we put this to sleep? Okay, well, you know what? Uh, I've never quite understood the process of adjournment. I think that uh, I'm not sure we really actually have to have a motion, uh, but may I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. All right, and uh, a second. And I'll second. with that, thank you. And with that, uh, let's consider this meeting adjourned. Thank you, everyone, for everything today, and we'll look forward to seeing everybody, hopefully in person, after the first of the year. Thank you. Goodbye, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.